<laughs> All right, excellent. Um, it is uh, 645 on Thursday, August 28th, and this is a meeting of the Law Committee, uh, which is preceding the Selectmen's Committee. The Law Committee is the Selectmen plus Wendy Rogers and Ken Troop. Ken Troop is um, participating remotely because of geographic distance reasons. He's on the, uh, uh, the phone here. Um, so, um, Don, why don't, why don't you explain where, where we stand with our um, uh, appointment of, of Town and, and Labor Council. Right, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it, is an, it is pretty much an annual um, event that the Town reappoints its uh, Appoints or reappoints its its town its town council and or labor council, and um, it is time for us to do that. Um, so that's why the law committee has been convened to have a discussion about the the, the reappointment of, of our of our council. And town council is currently um, Brackett and Lucas. Town council is Brackett and Lucas, and and our labor council is Miracle Call. Both from Worcester. Um, and there has been, there has been some some uh, a little bit of turmoil at at Brackett and, Brackett and Lucas. And um, I know I, I mentioned to you, Don, that I that I thought um, we we ought to give some thought, even though I I think the town's been well served by by Brackett and Lucas over the years. We ought to give some thought as to, to putting out uh, for bid and, and certainly invite them to, to participate. But at, at some point, um, I don't know if they do this immediately, but perhaps a, um, before before year end, um, because I, I know that, that Gary's had some some health problems and, and some of the other attorneys in the office have. So so I think that that's that's something we ought to um, uh, consider. I. On, on the labor council front, I, I mean, by, by all your reports, it seems as though you're you're happy with the uh, mm -hmm. the work that, that Myra McConnell has done. I think Myra McConnell has has done a very good job supporting us uh, as labor council, and Breck and Lucas have done a very good job supporting us as, as town council. Uh, nonetheless, as you said, um, you know there there has been a um, you know uh, Breck and Lucas are in a little bit of flux, I guess I would say right now. And um, and it has been three years since I we did our last uh, uh, request for proposals, and it certainly is is not a bad business practice to um, to to advertise for both. Um, so it would be it would, I would recommend I would recommend to the board uh, to the lab, uh, to the law committee that um, you appoint reappoint both existing firms through the end of this calendar year. And uh, task me with going off to uh, do a request for proposals to advertise for those services. Both of our current firms are certainly free to apply and respond to the RFP. And then the law committee would convene and interview whatever firms are interested, and then and then make whatever decision you make at that time. Mm -hmm. I, I think I think it's a good idea. What did you say? I believe it was three years ago. Um, certainly, since I've been here, we've done it once. Um, I think it had been about seven or eight years prior to that. Um, and maybe I wouldn't be recommending to go out to rebid right now. Circumstances were a little bit different, but it, it would seem to be a good business practice to do so. And uh, if we're going to do one, we, you know, we might as well do both. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And that's no. okay, right? Yeah, I think that's fine. Wendy? I, I absolutely agree. I mm -hmm. noticed Mr. Brackett wasn't able to come to town meeting, and you know, that's very awkward. Um, also, we have them split at the moment, and I know the split was because we were very well served on many situations with Brackett and Lucas, but felt that it was too much for them. Um, perhaps we could look into the possibility of having one. I've actually anticipated that and I, and I was thinking that we could word the uh, the request for proposals such that 
um, to make it clear that any firm is free to quote on, on one or both. Mm -hmm. I, I agree with you. Yeah. I think that's great, Tom. Yeah. Well, I guess suggestions suggestions have us reappoint both the end of the year you mm -hmm. put together an RFP. Mm -hmm. Can that be done by the end of the year, do you think, Don? I believe so. I mean, it's, you would want to make the appointment for appoint, appointments, I would say by somewhere before the end of November to allow for a transition period if there is any transition. Yeah. And so we have to assume, you have to assume the, the worst and plan for the best, which is there could be transition, so that would give us the month of December. So we would, and the, the other reason to time it that way is we would have everything lined up and ready to go and heading town into meeting. town meeting. Right. So when we start doing our work on the warrant and so forth. Right. So um, yes, I, I am confident that we could, we could get the RFP out in September, give a reasonable period of time for responses, and set up the interviews pretty quickly. Good. Yeah. It sounds very good. Okay. All right. Sounds good. Mm -hmm. Do we have a motion? I will make a motion that we um, send our two labor or our two legal contracts out for RFP uh, to be closed. I guess by end of November. Or, or, or it selection be done by the end. Of November. Selection be done by the end of November. And in the meantime, reappoint um, her two existing uh, legal firms uh, through the end of the calendar year. I'll second that. All right, we, we have to do a roll call vote because we have a remote participant. So I'd ask Linda to call the, the roll of the law committee. Ms. Craig? Yes. Delaney? Aye. Wasaki? Aye, yes. Uh, Rogers? Yes. Troop? Aye. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I, I, I think that that's that's all the the law committee needs to do at this point. Thank you for uh, joining us remotely, Ken. Thanks, Ken. All right. Thanks, Ken. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you. Thank you. So we have, we're not going to start our selections meeting until 7 o'clock, but you can keep the tape running. <laughs> we'll act accordingly. <laughs> we'll just sit here and stir. <laughs> We need to make a book or something. Yeah. 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 Well, we can read about the Worcester Revolution. Well, I, was yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know that there had been a Worcester Revolution in 1774. I didn't either. I didn't either. I could have said better PR films, I guess. Really, that Longfellow guy. <laughs> You know, there are a lot of interesting activities around that. Yeah. They're doing muster and the big event that Oh, yeah. No, it's, on, it's actually on our agenda. We're going to talk about it. It's on the Blackman's agenda. Yeah. Yeah. What is a team building experience? We'll be participating in the re I've never used to call you guys, but I'm on that one. I usually call you guys more. Well, historically, you're selecting, our selecting, we're writing letters to the Blackman's Agenda. Really quite active. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Well, they cut off Hudson. That was part of uh, okay. what happened. Oh, yeah. Yeah, good point. But we're all originating from Lancaster, right? Mm -hmm. Right. To use the the mother town. Yeah. Yeah. Left the town too well. Yeah. Yeah. It's the common ancestor. Patients are all two tools. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> 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 Did you give me a new street level? Well, I'm off the roster now. I'm not a person 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 now. I'm not a
Yeah. I'm still sure I find yeah, it. Yeah, it's the first one. We're going to get it back down. Huh? Yeah, all right, well, come in. As soon as you go to really in the It's a bell curve, Jada. Remember, Arthur, and then everyone made you. Is Jonathan upstairs? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. She's looking for a bunch of things. She brings the balls. They don't need to buy that hand. That's a common. I don't think that's a good thing. Yeah. Bolton fun facts. Uh, Nan, you got me? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. The vault oh, was constructed in 1806. The, um, the Lions are having their 50th anniversary in Chartners on September 13th. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right, it's uh, 7 p.m. Uh, this is the, uh, the Bolton Board of Selectmen's meeting for Thursday, August 28th. Um, our first item of business is actually a joint meeting. We also have the planning board here, and it's to act on an application of Paragon Holdings LLC, which is seeking a special permit from the planning board and site plan approval from the selectmen for a proposed rooftop solar installation located at 41 Main Street. Do we have a representative of Paragon here? Yeah. Come on up. Hi, how are you doing? Hi, how are you? Um, I've got some, uh, some plans that some small ones that came by the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, thank you very much. Why don't you sit here so you can, because our, our planning board is okay. kind of over there so you can try and catch all of us at, at, at the same time. Okay. All right. Thank you very much to the board of Slackman and the planning board uh, for giving us some time tonight. Um, how would you like to, uh, to proceed? Well, what, why, don't you, why don't you give give an overview and then I think what we'll probably do is, is turn over to the planning board for their questions because the special permit process is actually a little more detailed and then the selectmen may have, have questions related to site plan approval. Okay. Good. All right. So, uh, so the project is uh, 1.18 megawatts DC, um, slightly less than one megawatt AC of capacity. Um, all the panels are located on the roof of the building, which is located at 41 uh, Main Street. Total number of panels are uh, 3,927. Uh, they're mounted at a five degree angle uh, towards the south. Um, they sit, uh, the highest point of the panels is less than a foot off the roof, so they're basically at roof level. Um, the owner of the building recently put on a new uh, mechanically fastened uh, roof on the building, so it was a ballasted roof with a membrane underneath. They took off the, uh, the stone ballast and put on a uh, mechanically fastened membrane. Uh, and then we'll, uh, we'll put the solar panels on top of the, the new membrane that was installed. Uh, most of the system, uh, it's not going to be visible uh, from the ground level or from the street or anything like that or from abutting properties. Um, the only thing that you'll be able to see from the system is that there'll be a few uh, conduits uh, coming down the south side of the building uh, into the electrical area. Uh, those conduits will be painted the same color as the, the brick color of the building. Um, the system will tie into the building's uh, electrical system uh, in the switch yard that's located on the south side of the building. It'll uh, uh, plug into, um, we're essentially uh, just putting another bay on the switch gear which is outside and that'll be the tap into the, uh, into the building's electrical system. So. Um, we, uh, we applied uh, for approval from National Grid starting in June or August of 2013. 
went through their nine month approval process uh, and in um, uh, I believe it was March of 2014 um, uh, Paragon Holdings entered into an interconnection services agreement with National Grid uh, for the project. Um, we have, uh, we've reviewed the, um, the design of the project with uh, Chief Menser of the um, uh, Fire Department. Um, uh, met with him one day and sat down and went over the plans. Uh, he had a few um, minor comments on, um, on the layout of the project, which we uh, made changes to, so the updated plans that we submitted uh, incorporate uh, those few changes that he requested. Uh, and then uh, we agreed on a few um, items, including uh, providing a training session once the system is built, uh, providing some um, reflective markings uh, on conduits on the roof. Um, and, uh, and he said that you know he was fine with the, uh, the amendments that we had made. Um, let's see, uh, the life expectancy of the system uh, is roughly 25 years. Uh, that's the warranty life of the panels. Uh, the construction timeline for the project would be we would start, uh, once we would get uh, a special permit issued and then a building electrical permit. Uh, and the system uh, would, would take about two months to construct. Uh, and ideally, we'd be uh, finished uh, before um, much of the cold uh, weather comes uh, and be online uh, in the November time frame. Uh, that would be ideal. Um, in terms of the uh, maintenance of the system, we do annual maintenance uh, of the system, on front of maintenance, and respond to um, uh, uh, when, when when required. If there's a, if any of the panels are out or something like that, we'll respond as necessary. We have a, a web-based monitoring system, so we're uh, we're monitoring it, and the customers uh, monitoring uh, their system as well. Uh, I'll, I'll pause there for a, uh, an overview of the system and. We can go further into uh, if anyone has questions. The, I, I saw that there was a, a in, in the package we got, there was a letter from a, a structural engineer, I guess indicating once the ballast were, were removed, this actually is, there's less weight on the roof than, with this system than what had been previously been there. Is that, is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's correct. Um, are there's handouts for us. What's up? Are these handouts for us? Uh, these were things to submit, yeah. This is a, uh, uh, I, I can start, do you want the uh, plan set? Yeah, no, I, yeah, why don't, why don't you hand, hand out, I mean, we, we've got some materials, but if you have handouts, might as well. Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. These are. Mr. Chairman, could you ask this gentleman to the Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, my name is James Schwartz from uh, Independent Solar. Uh, we're the developer on the project. We're from uh, Paragon Holdings. And how many other projects does in, Independent Solar have around the state? Uh, this will be our fourth project in Massachusetts. Uh, we've we've uh, built a, a two megawatt system in West Bridgewater. We built a half a megawatt system in Plymouth. Uh, and we built a hundred kilowatt system in Houston. Uh, we've done several projects in uh, nearby states, uh, in Connecticut, New Jersey. Now, what happens on a five percent angle when it snows on those solar panels? Are they is it, does it turn off the juice? Yeah, it does. Um, and when you go through a, a, a winter like what we had last year, we actually, on some of our systems, didn't generate for over four weeks. Um, but that's kind of baked into our annual projections of how much the, uh, the system's going to generate. We know that in the Northeast, there's going to be times when, uh, when the system will, uh, will be covered with snow. Does the developer own the systems, the equipment, or does the owner? No, uh, I mean, it, it depends on what the, every solar project's different, but in, in, in this, this case, case yeah. in this case, it will be the owner of the building. <laughs> Paragon's going to own it. So you're a fee for service? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So when you talk about ballast, the, the previous had a membrane with stone over it. Mm -hmm. So that was removed. Okay. Right, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. So people won't be going up on the roof to clear the panels of snow? No. 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 And is there a parapet on that roof, or is it just? No, it just goes off the edge, yeah. So you're saying the panels will only be one foot off the roof 
viewed from the parking lot, or really they're going to just explain oh, that? Um, yeah, no, I mean, if you were standing on the roof, they'd be less than a foot. So, okay. so you you won't see them from um, uh, from the from the parking lot. <coughs> there, I, you know, you probably go by commercial buildings, uh, you know, where you never know there was a solar system installed. Uh, one of the things that, that site plan review or, or this process can look at is is generally is noise and what. In, in this sort of system, do the, the, what makes noise? The inverters and what? Yeah, the inverters are the only thing that, that, that makes noise. Everything else is solid state. So the, the panels themselves are a solid state semiconductor. Uh, the only thing else up on the roof are um, conduit wiring. Uh, there's some junction boxes um, on the roof. So there's, there's no mechanical components or uh, moving parts up on the roof. Uh, the inverters, uh, there'll be four inverters for this project. They make a slight humming sound when they're running. They also have um, fans in them. Um, uh, but it's, it's not, not, not a lot of noise. And the neighbor's pretty far away as well. I mean, it seems like Par Paragon, the owner, the owner of the building's the, the one, right. only one who'd be concerned about the yeah. noise of his own. Yeah. yeah. And presumably the inverters aren't making noise at night. So you're not going to disturb the neighbors at night. Right. So, okay. so. There's no lighting for the project uh, other than what is already existing uh, at the site. So has there been any comments by um, residents of Bolton Woods Way? Anyone's aware of anybody here from that community? They're the direct abutters. Well, since they're not going to be able to see it, and they're not going to be able to hear it, okay. I don't think they're, exactly. they're going to be really impacted at all by this. Yeah, yeah they're pretty distant, the butters. I, I think it's fine. I, I have no problems or questions with it. <laughs> Yeah, no, no, certainly from, from a site plan approval yeah. perspective, there, there doesn't seem to be much, much there. <laughs> and I think, you know, and I guess it's something we can think about, are, as written, our, our bylaw technically includes this installation, but I think it's mostly um, counts in terms of what you'd have on the ground and, and sh sort of shielding and things like that. So we might want to think about whether we want to have a, a, a separately address uh, Roof installations, uh, but that's uh, sort of down the road. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, no, I, I think that's. Uh, I think it's a great use of a uh, of dead space there. Yeah. Hmm? Any other questions from the planning board? No. Well, I guess we would probably need, I mean, if we were to uh, close, close these hearings, um, we could, the, the two boards would vote separately for yes. the, uh, one is for the, the, the it's, for the um, selectmen, it's approval of the site plan, and for the planning board, it's a special permit under our Bolting Code Section 250-26. So, um, okay. Mm -hmm. okay. So I'll move that uh, we approve the uh, site plan um, modifications as shown in the plan. I'll second that. All those in favor? All right. Aye. Do we have to do our own vote or later? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Right. <laughs> Great. It can be now one of them. There's no other question. It could be done now one way to wrap it up. Okay. 
And James, did you bring copies of the emergency response plan? Mm -hmm. I did. I just want to make sure that all gets on the record. Yeah, so. should I hand that to you? Sure, that's fine. Here's the response plan, the interconnection agreement. Copy and then that. also you had uh, safety information regarding the roof material. Mm -hmm. Yep. So I just want to make sure that mm -hmm. that all gets submitted. And here's the structural report. I know sure. it's already been submitted. Okay, thank you. Um, and then just for the planning board, just a few other items that are in the bylaw that you may want to just bring up or mention. Um, lighting, James, there's no need for additional lighting, correct? Nope. Okay, and signs and advertising? Nope. Um, let's see. And obviously there's not going to be any site clearing, any need to remove vegetation. Um, no, only on a temporary basis. There's a um, uh, there's some shrubbery um, that's up against the uh, switchyard, okay. so we'll remove the shrubbery temporarily so that we can access the switchyard, put the inverters in there, and then we'll put it back in. Okay. Um, and then in terms of abandonment, did we talk about that at all yet? Um, <clears throat> no, I mean it, you know it's kind of a fixture on the roof. Okay. Um, typically, they they stay up there until the uh, roof is replaced okay. um, and uh, since it's a new roof you know the roof has basically the same life expectancy uh, as a solar system okay. so if Paragon goes out of business or goes away for some reason what happens in that case um, just keeps operating so yeah the building probably keeps yeah, operating right. yeah I mean um, uh, any small uh, uh, generating system is allowed to sell into the grid at wholesale rate mm -hmm. So uh, the power would go to National Grid, and National Grid would provide the uh, you know, compensation at the wholesale rate if there's no power usage in the building. And the power purchase agreement is between the owner of the property and the grid? Um, no, actually, the, uh, the power purchase agreement is going to be, they're going to use it themselves. Okay. Uh, yeah, so the grid provides like net metering services. So okay. they basically can, they'll run a bi directional meter. Uh, but Paragon will use all the power that's generated by the system in a year. Okay. Um, so yeah, they're, they're just producing their own energy and reducing their bill for the National Grid. So that reduction of the bill with National Grid is done vis-a-vis -vis some sort of a contract between the owner and the grid. Yeah. Presumably the building gets sold, you've got a fixture on top of the building, and the contract gets assigned to the owner. Yeah. That's purchased by the owner. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I I think we might want to just discuss it for a few minutes together. You know, so why don't we adjourn to our, you know, our next meeting space, and we'll we'll uh, we'll uh, you know vote on the special permit. Sure. So are, are you going to close your hearing though now? Because I mean, you don't you don't have to vote for a week or two. On, on, but um, but I, I'm just thinking. If, if you're well or you can continue this hearing to a place 15 minutes from now right. down That's the street right. if, 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 yeah. so as long as people are advised of that you, you've got got either either choice um, the, 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 let me ask before before you leave let me, let me raise with the planning board we have I guess the, I think this may be the first site plan um, uh, that we've considered in the more than two years I've been a selectman so it hasn't come up very often, but we know, I know that there are a couple of things in the pipeline that, where the planning board is being asked for a special permit and there will have to be site plan uh, review by the selectmen. And what are your thoughts? It seems to me it's more efficient for the applicants to have, have a, 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 a single session. What are the thoughts of the, the planning board as to how, um, whether we should combine sessions like this or whether you'd, you'd rather sort of let the applicant make make the rounds in the uh, well I think this came up in relationship to uh, the property formerly known as the salt box um, and you know the feeling among some members of the planning board is that we haven't had a report yet from the design review board uh, we haven't met with anybody from there so it seemed premature to have a joint meeting with the Board of Selectmen until we get up on get up to speed on that project. So I think in you know, so in cases like that and also, you know, the Clinton Savings Bank, they just, you know, think that we need to review before we come into this room um, and have a joint meeting. 
I would think that it would have to do with the complexity of the project. This one's very straightforward, and Larry is a longtime planning board alum. You know how deep into details uh, we can get and how voluminous the conversation can be. So if we had a you know, complex project, uh, you three would be along for the ride for many, many hours. And you know, that we may want a different special session if we were to do something like that rather than tagging along on a regularly scheduled session. My thoughts. All right. Well, maybe I guess we can treat them on a case by case yeah. basis. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well thank thanks for thanks for joining us tonight. Thank, thank you very much. much. Well where, where if you, you want to announce where you're where you're where, you're where, where the hearing is <laughs> where your hearing is going. So we are we'll moving over to those yeah we'll continue this hearing to the Houghton building for seven thirty. Nice to see you. Come on down. Um, right, so no one's here but me and Leslie Breeze from Public Ways. But we can start. Well, you can handle it. <laughs> <laughs> This is just just for the uh, to make it clear. This is a discussion regarding the uh, proposed mobility plan and report of the mobility committee. So, hopefully, this is our last stop um, before we'd like to make it public. So, um, we're here just to get any comments, concerns on the board's selectmen's part. Um, concerning the report. I've met previously with uh, the committee. I met was probably early, early this month or late last month. It was probably late, probably last month. Last month, month. Yeah. Yeah. No, I went through it this afternoon. It's a very, very comprehensive. Um, I guess maybe, I don't know if you're considering this, but there, you've got a lot of things that you want to do. Mm -hmm. um, some things that you can't do unless the state does it. Like things I want to say, you know, lights and those kind of things. Do you have a, a list of priorities? Because obviously all this is going to cost you and what you feel are, you know, if you want to take it like one step at a time, you know, if you had to pick what's the number one thing and then what's the number two thing? We do have a list. Uh, what we consider to be top or priority projects in the report. And is anybody with No, not yet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, on page seven, specific initiatives. And in those specific in initiatives, we were putting together what would be our top priorities. And at the top of the list, surprisingly, is the um, high school area of uh, Green Forbush 117 intersection. We see that as a real red flag area. And remediation for that would be very complicated, but we, we just see it as a very dangerous um, area. Um, the cheapest fix would be probably the little walkway um, going up Watacotic, connecting Main Street to the um, Memorial Field area oh, yeah. to connect a whole loop system that we've mentioned um, uh -huh. using all the lands behind the school. Um, <clears throat> But the specific initiatives are the ones that pretty much are the, the, the areas that we see probably should be addressed first. Okay. Yeah, no, I thought this, this was very, very comprehensive, very well done. And, and the way ambitious it places, you know, and I, and, I, and I noticed like one of the suggestions was, and, and it makes sense, and it certainly for funding these, but to, that we should, uh, 
pass the, the CPA, but I think the town's already turned that down twice. So, so I mean, there. Uh, yeah, I, I but I, that, I, I, I think you should be am, ambitious in the report, and maybe just with the, um, uh, where, where you have your your specific initiatives to, as Stan suggested, maybe to sort of number them to indicate priorities. That that would be the only suggestion I'd have. Yeah. yeah. Um, I would say for the CPA, in talking to town planners from other towns, um, there is still plenty of money, and the money can be used towards walkways, um, considered recreational. So that is a source of funding if you know the town would ever want to pursue it. Yeah. Unfortunately, the, the problem with the CPA and, and why it one of the, one of the reasons why it didn't pass twice before was in order to get the money you have to sort of make a contribution right, in kind right. and the, the townspeople would prefer not to bank money uh, i mean unfortunately there are other towns around who have who did it when the program was young and they reaped millions of dollars uh, so I mean, those times are gone but you know I, I think it would still be worthwhile to give it another shot mm -hmm. um, you also mentioned you can give, you know, being part of that, you're also eligible to apply for right. grants. It, it, it makes you more eligible, yes. Um, and um, another thing that we um, recommend is that the town uh, become a complete streets, adopt a complete streets policy. And that is something that can be done on the cheap. Um, the town of Littleton. Um, just recently passed one. They had um, help from MAPC um, and uh, they received all sorts of accolades from um, you know the different um, groups um, for their plan and it's available on their website. Um, the Mass DOT adopts the complete streets policy and if they have in their, their green dot program their policy uh, directives if you go into it it has all the stuff mm -hmm. that we are recommending the problem with 117 it gets a little more complicated because it's a minor arterial road so that when you're talking about heavy volume of traffic because we're feeding into 495 it's a truck route that then it complicates you know what the state is willing to do and so i think we've got to be very aggressive um, and very well read on what we're going to get out of them when the discussions um, start. But I think if we adopt a complete streets policy, it's telling the state that we are very committed to making our town more pedestrian and bicycle friendly. And I, I just think it would send the right message mm -hmm. when it comes time for yeah. you know the talks. How would that, if, if Harold's paving one of our smaller roads, what would, if we've adopted that, what would he be doing different? And that was Harold's concern. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, you can put language in your policy that can sort of, you know, where feasible, you know, you can always use that term to, um, because I don't see all the roads in Bolton with walkways. I mean, I don't see it possible. I don't see widening roads and walkways to accommodate bike lanes. I mean, it's we've identified the major roads that we think really need these, and they're your numbered route roads primarily. Um, but um, yeah, you just ha would have to, in the language of writing your policy, you would have to work around that. Yeah, I noticed you had other inexpensive solutions like changes to the planning board regs to yes. sort of require more sidewalks and then give developers the option of uh, sort of buying buying their way out of that with contributing to a to a fund. We uh, talked with them and they are considering that yeah. when they review their rules and regs this year. Yeah. So um, we also would like them to, um, and I passed on to Don. Um, going a little bit further with developers and it would be not only residential but also commercial developers to if the town can prove that the uh, local byways are being affected by the development and they can require 
the developer to make roadway improvements, um, pedestrian or um, mm -hmm. vehicle. Um, Sudbury has one, it's a general bylaw called the Public Ways Access Permit, and Stowe in their subdivision rules and regs has language in it that also asks for these um, things. So it's just going a little bit further, um, and I think a prime example would be Century Mill. And um, the Century Mill South Bolton Road intersection, that could have been cleaned up very nicely if we had something in place that you know, we could require the developer to, f to fix it up. All right, I see one of your members of your committee has showed up here. We, start, oh, sorry, we, we started early. Do <laughs> 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 you want to come up? We started early. No, I think it's, it's, it's very good, very well done, and it certainly provides a lot of examples. Um, that's the fun one. We're passing the hat. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I did review the report myself, too, and I just want to commend the Mobility Committee for that report. It was very comprehensive, as you stated, and very ambitious. Um, I, I like the approach of sort of step by step by step and some things such as what you talked about the connecting the dots of the sidewalks on Water Aquatic I think is a, a very good project and we would strongly support from the police department any project that can be accomplished with the means that would add to both the sidewalks, sidewalk safety and the bike lanes because unfortunately over the past year we've seen an upswing in pedestrian and bicyclist accidents because more people are getting out there, it's a beautiful town um, and people are getting out there, huge increase in bike traffic and big increase in pedestrian traffic. And as I said, unfortunately, we've had some very, very serious accidents where both pedestrians and bicyclists mm -hmm. have been hit. So I, from the police department standpoint, would certainly support any, any improvements we can make to sidewalk safety and bike safety. Thank you. So what we can do is, um, under our specific initiatives, um, we can do a numbering system for uh, for the priorities. Mm -hmm. And um, is there anything else that? Yeah, or even you know maybe numbering system, or or at least to say, you know, identify top priorities and then then secondary. Because you know I'm not sure if saying something is is tenth or eleventh on the list that may is that as significant but um, but but as some some sort of prioritization we've been working on a matrix system <laughs> <laughs> is really making our head spin and pulling out these priorities and the one that we can agree on it, that keeps coming up at the top is was the high school area mm -hmm. um, so yeah we could probably incorporate that into the report I think we certainly should. That was one of our top priorities. And interestingly, the state, when they made their comments about the kind of changes that they might do to 117, did not mention that intersection as a top priority. They said they might do something that were very vague about what they were doing. They concentrated instead on the 110, 117 intersection, which works even the way it works with its antique and the bike. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, no, mm -hmm. you're right though. I mean, the high school is very dangerous with the you know, kids running over the pizza place. Yeah, so. when I did my my review uh, of 117 with the state last month, uh, actually that was in June, uh, we did stop at the high school area and they did talk about that area as, as requiring work. And they did say that was something that they would, they would evaluate. Okay. What do you think? What do you think of Lancaster turning five corners into four corners? Very <laughs> smart move. <laughs> <laughs> really, I think it's very awkward. But yeah, it's safer. It's a lot easier to navigate. <laughs> that is excellent. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so we'd like to make this public as soon as possible because it's we've been working on it for two years, and really the t timeliness has been scheduling in to meet with different um, groups to discuss it. So. Um, I guess what we'll do is we'll bring back your suggestions, um, Larry, on um, 
maybe by identifying rather than numbering the specific initiatives if we can include that um, matrix that will show our specific prior uh, priorities and it would be listed mm -hmm. um, sure no how, to, however uh, you want to do it and I don't think you know you don't, you don't need to see it again I think you're you know, you're there yeah. okay. and how do you suggest we go about releasing this um, I, well, I would suggest the board tonight, if they're favorable, that they could vote to accept the uh, accept the, the plan. Um, then you could um, it can be it can, we can do a few things with it. You can send it. You can send it to me. Um, we could, I'm sure, we could take a copy of it uh, and put it up on the website mm -hmm. uh, and uh, have a plan, have a copy of it on file in the town clerk's office as well. And I would suggest that um, that we, we get a, a copy to the planning department. So mm -hmm. we've got that. So I think that would be our way to start. Okay. Okay, very good. Anything else? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'll um, move we accept the uh, consulting mobility committee on uh, non motorized transportation recommendations. I'll second that. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Job. Very good job. Thank you. The next item on our agenda is a recommendation from the police chief, the police chief uh, to sponsor a candidate to the uh, Reserve Police Academy. Chief. Good, evening, Chief. How are you? Good, thank you. I believe our candidate is here. Here it is. Michael, come on up. Have a seat. This is uh, Michael Kenny. Michael is a uh, firefighter. Uh, Hopefully, you won't see him at your house soon. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they, they actually. I want uh, along a copy of Michael's resume because he's a he's a very impressive young man. And we're very fortunate to have him uh, in the capacities he's in here in the town of Boulder. Um, what Michael would like to do, he has a vested interest, obviously, in the public safety field. Mm -hmm. And he would like to uh, round that out with some police training. And he would like to pay for himself to go to the police academy. He's awaiting seats either in the reserve or the full-time academies, whichever mm -hmm. one would come about first. But there will be no cost to the town of Bolton. You would pay the tuition. But as, you, as you're aware, under uh, state requirements, they need a police department to sponsor him so that they're not inundated by thousands of people that want to become police officers on their own nickel. So um, he's got a great background. He's been an outstanding firefighter here in town. Um, he's assisted our department many, many times. Um, he's in a leadership position within the fire department, which he can certainly explain to you. Mm -hmm. So I would be very proud and very honored on, on behalf of the Bolton Police Department and the town of Bolton to sponsor him. So that should he decide to take the fork in the road for police as opposed to fire, he would have that training. Mm -hmm. So basically looking for your approval. Sounds good to me. Yeah, no, no, you're an excellent yeah. candidate. And certainly, yeah. if you like to ask him any questions, he's ready. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. Well, after an intro like that, you just need to be quiet. You can't. That's Quit while you're here. Well, certainly, any, any uh, additional public safety training he would receive. Uh, would benefit the town in his position as a as a firefighter. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it uh, makes him a very well-rounded individual. Excellent. No, that's good. Great. Right. So I want to move that we vote to sponsor Michael Kenny to the. Uh, well, is it reserve or full time or? It depends on whichever either. seat he, he could get into. To, it, to right? the, the process is the yeah. same. Yeah. I will second. All those in favor. Aye. 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 Great Good luck. Good luck. Good luck. Thank you, Jim. Sorry, I had to get all dressed up. Thank you. What time do you live in? Not Bolton. Yes. Okay, very good. Thank you. Was it? You can make a short one. I've got these over there. Revise, revise. Um. This one that you sent out earlier. Yes. Yes. 
ahead of uh, schedule is a discussion regarding Tennessee gas pipeline uh, and also a review of a draft resolution related to the Tennessee gas pipeline. Um, do, do we have folks on the Conservation Commission? We do. Yeah, uh, Brian Berby and uh, James Stones. Yeah. Well, why, why don't you, you come up? Cause I, because I, I think when we, when we first scheduled this, we were, we were thinking that we to sort of we should give some thought to the how the town wants to approach surveying on properties and our current position is no surveying but but at some point if um, there's a petition to the DPU by Kinder Morgan to get access to those properties what what's our position then what what do we want in terms of information from the surveys um, notification of when they're going to be there, the ability to shadow them. I mean, what, what should we be looking for, do you think? It's a good question. Um, we'd love for them to go through the regular process of just obtaining an NOI um, and going through the regular vetting process that any citizen or company in town would have to go through. Uh, it would allow us to I'm sorry, could you just open the door there? Yeah. Sorry. But it would allow us to set an order of conditions with them so we could actually, they don't think their survey is going to be too invasive and there's reason to believe it wouldn't be overly invasive depending on what they needed for equipment, but they don't know what they need for equipment. Um, so that would give us a chance locally to say what they could and couldn't use and if they ran to an occasion where they felt they needed to use equipment, it would force them to come back and explain mm -hmm. what they needed okay. to use and why and also let us mitigate what the circumstance be. You know, if you bring that track vehicle through, this is what we're going to need you to repair the land afterwards. Um, that's what we'd really like to see is still that, that um, to be able to keep local control along mm -hmm. those lines. Um, and, you know, I have other points about the process, but that's... So would you say that, that notice of intent, would, would you say that you would require that not just on... Um, Town land, but but anywhere there might be be wetlands impacted. Is Correct. That? Yeah, um, we're hoping, and I, I mean we can jump around a little bit too because it's it's interesting with the first process and how it goes. And there's, I think it was eight different points within the process that we can give input uh, on different things. Um, <coughs> But along those lines, uh, one of the things we, we're hoping that we'll recommend to FERC, because as FERC takes recommendations from communities, um, they have the ability to um, to require Kinder Morgan to get approved from the state legislature to cross any Article 97 land, which would protect all of that land, and something that most uh, conservation commissions are very interested in having them do. Um, that's land put in trust by individuals. It's not supposed to be touched. There are a lot of protections against it. Um, state legislatures are usually the only ones who can return it. Um, and we would ask FERC to actually defer, uh, have Kinder Morgan ask the state legislatures for permission. They would get it. No, 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 I'm no, sorry, no. we can't. It, it seems like a good idea to close the door. But. How about me? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you're better off telling the people to be quiet. <laughs> Um, but to have this, uh, no, it's fine. To have the state uh, legislatures uh, step in, usually what the legislature would do is then kick it back to the local ordinances and allow us, again, to have that local control. Sure. Um, and we could also ask FERC along the li on lines, and again, it's, it's up to them. They'll, they'll, they'll talk to the uh, National Environmental Protection Agency. They'll get their input, uh, but there's some things that we can ask for that we would really like to see is um, requiring uh, any certificate that they give to Kinder Morgan. Uh, require compliance with MESA, which is the Mass Endangered Species Act, um, and the Mass Wetland Protection Act, WPA, so I have all my little uh, initials. Um, and as part of the WPA, it brings them into compliance with, with Mass General Law, with Chapter 44, Section 53G, um, which would allow us, so that, that was another little point I had about the surveying too, that would allow us to charge them professional services 
for us to survey the land um, and to come up with a, a basic revegetation plan. Um, normally that's something the town would have to spend the money for themselves. If the state would enact chapter 44, or section 53G, if they were, if they're, if their certificate was contingent upon that, then we would still have the ability to charge Kinder Morgan for any of those services. Mm -hmm. um, basically, a lot of what we'd like to see along the lines is, is just pushing for, just to have them go with all the state laws that are in place. Um, I think that's our best bet, is just to have that local control. Um, and really, if, if it does come to pass to have some say after the project, um, there have been a lot of problem, not problems with these projects, but depending on the amount of say you have, a lot of times when the, when the project's done, it looks like, and the example they always give is like a golf course, so you have this got conservation land, and you'll have this like straight, flat dog leg going through because they have to maintain it, they have to keep it clear, you can't grow trees on it. Um, but you can have some say, depending on what kind of seed mix is planted, and then to mess with the topography a bit, depending on endangered species, they'll, they can actually require them to change the topography a bit, so it's not just straight and flat, they'll put in some gullies, they'll bring up some boulders, they'll try to make it look more, more natural, depending. Um, and that's a lot of what we'd like to see from the commission is, is really to push for on um, an active uh, or putting within their certificate that they have to comply with those local laws. I think on, on Article 97, yes, that that's generally uh, land is held for conservation purposes. To take it out of that, it's a, a two thirds vote of the legislature. Is that right? Correct. Yeah, don't quote me on it, but I believe that is. Well, we conveniently that. have a, a member of the Great General Court with us, Kate Hogan. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and yes, the green button. <laughs> and the um, Kate, had there been what? what I've heard people advance this theory and it's a good idea. Is what do legislators think of that? That is, is a one of these pipelines cutting through a, a, a what would otherwise be protected conservation land? Is that going to be enough in your minds to have to to trigger that that two thirds vote? Well, absolutely, and I think that as we move forward, and I'll make just a very short report on my experiences around the pipeline from the point of view of the legislature, I would see it as one tool in the toolbox of working and negotiating and um, seeing, you know, to uh, a clear space of what, what we're going to be looking at. So I would see it as one tool in the toolbox. I don't see it as defining anything, but I do see that as a powerful tool. And I also believe that those kinds of uh, tools are probably not as prevalent in other states that Kinder Morgan has dealt with. I think that they are have chosen a particularly uh, special area in terms of open space, preserved, and protected lands. And I think that they will be surprised to see exactly how well protected they indeed are. So. What, uh, can, can, can you share with us some of the other sort of tools, tools in the toolbox that the people are, are legislators are, are thinking might, might well, be? Well, do you about? want me to, I can present or I could wait to no, no, this is this is fine. I think it, no, no. Why don't we if if no, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. No, why don't you come up with We we've got a lot of luck to cover. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so I will. Um, what I wanted to do this evening. Good morning, everybody. Hi, Mark. Hi, Larry. Hi, Stan. Hi, Um I just wanted to let folks know what's going on at the state level because indeed there have been discussions and ongoing discussions um, for, for various reasons and um, in various situations. Um, on July 15th, uh, I met with in the State House with both Department of Public Utilities and the Executive Office of Energy and Environment. Um, the EA Secretary was made Bartlett, the DPU Chair is Ann Berwick. I met with 10 legislators, uh, including the future Senate President Stan Rosenberg, who does have it going through a number of his towns as well, which mm -hmm. um, would not bode well for Kinder Morgan, I think, in, in the short term, at least in the legislature, uh, because I think he has come out you know, distinctly opposed to it. Many of my colleagues have as many as six, seven, eight, nine, ten towns that are actually affected by this going through it. So you can imagine that that becomes a virtual hotbed of activity against the, the line. 
Um, and what was discussed at that meeting were concerns over the energy needs at the moment, which was um, rather confusing because we all know that NESCO came out with this study that said we will need a certain amount of energy uh, come this winter and come the near future and then say the next five years as we move to clean energy. Um, that study was actually done without a number of uh, energy producing, um, for instance, uh, the uh, plants in um, the, the two coal producing plants are offline, only one was included. Uh, we didn't have uh, the nuclear power plant offline as, as well. So you have in this region a number of situations that will, will uh, sort of feed into um, the need for energy. So that is not, I think, a, a false presumption um, that we will need um, you know, forms of energy that are not clean energy in the very short term. Um, but how that's how that is um, arrived at, and how we decide to do it, and how we decide to move forward can be very different um, than than what's being discussed here. We also uh, discussed the uh, through Article 97 land the routing of the pipeline, and that was discussed, and it was discussed that that there were ways to um, you know stop and and require votes and and require compliance and so that may or may not be a huge issue um, moving forward um, we also talked about the filing process and the rewriting routing or the possible rerouting of pipelines through a uh, right of ways and and how that would that would work out um, we also met um, legislators also met with various municipalities um, our own um, Bolton town administrator was there on July 28th uh, with Bolst Bol Boylston, Bolton, Berlin, and Northborough. Um, and we also met with um, staff from Congresswoman Songus' office and McGovern's office uh, to talk about um, the actions as a group of communities to halt the pipeline um, if that was where people wanted to go and what we could all do to intervene on the FERC process. And of course, that would probably have a lot of play on the federal side and that's and and I have stayed and will continue to stay in touch with um, Congresswoman Songus office um, and then there was also a meeting that I called with um, members of um, the Executive Office of Energy and Environment and also the Department of Public Utilities to talk about the creation of a website that actually reflects on the state level the process of um, the pipeline and how it is moving through uh, the Department of Public Utilities. And it, for me, and, and the point that I was trying to, to make that it needs to reflect the process, the information that they have, and what the documents they're using to make the decisions that, that they need to make, um, and that there needs to be a way for, to allow feedback to that website so that uh, members of the community, uh, members of my community and all the communities along the uh, route are allowed input and that they know that that input is going to be seen and heard by Department of Public Utilities. Um, from all of these meetings, uh, particularly the one in um, Berlin um, with uh, both uh, the administrators, the legislators, and the staff from the con congressional offices, um, the, the House of Representatives decided that they would create a resolution acknowledging um, very serious concerns over the proposed pipeline and calling for uh, an immediate halt in further development to allow for deliberations from citizens and the general court. Our greatest concern was that we are now out of formal session. By that I mean we no longer meet to vote on legislation. At the end of um, the legislative session, uh, there will be informals, but it will be nothing that would really allow us to look at uh, the process it is as it is occurring. And so through, the, through this resolution we resolve that the Honorable House of Representatives implores the New England, New England States Committee on Electricity and Kinder Morgan Northeast Energy Direct to place an immediate moratorium on any and all developments related to this project until the 189th session convenes to allow the democratic process to proceed and to ensure every impacted citizen of this proposed project has a full voice in government and in the Commonwealth. So that is still uh, looking to be moved through uh, informal session. Um, we hope to have that out shortly and to be able to 
uh, present that to all uh, as need be from the governor to um, federal office holders so everyone has an idea of what we're trying to do. I can leave this here um, for folks to look at um, prior to passage. I don't think there'll be any changes that will be made to the resolution. And so those are the things that have been going on on the state level um, where you know, basically, uh, we too are organizing. I was talking to many of the folks in Bolton, and they said, "What, you know, what would you recommend that we do?" And I would say, "Organize." <laughs> you know, it's always the best thing to do, and we are doing that on the state level as well, so that you know everyone that that is is going to be impacted uh, as the legislators uh, will be able to react to uh, what is happening on the ground, be able to react to what is happening in on the state level, and be able to react to what's happening on the federal level. So. All right. Well, great. Well, thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. And if you have any questions, we can take them. And I'll, I'll, I can sit back here for a bit and answer the calls. No, you can't. Can I a clarification on the delay? Um, would that be affected if they pre-file? Because they're talking about pre-filing in September. Well, yes, it, it depends. We want to get this through and we want, to, we want to present it and say, from the point of view of the legislature, we would prefer that the process stops. So we need to get the resolution through in order to present it for those people that we need to present it to. So, so would that prevent them from pre-filing if no. it gets passed? Or no, it won't prevent them, but it would say that the process needs to stop. I, I, ultimately, what I believe is we need to slow down the process. I believe these are the first folks that have presented to the issue of we may need more energy. It doesn't mean that because they're the first ones to the dance that there are dates. So, you know, in that way, I believe that there doesn't need to be a huge rush to make a decision. They will try to do that because that's their business and that's what they're trying to do. I fully appreciate what they're doing as well. But um, I don't feel, and many of the people in the legislature certainly don't feel that there needs to be any rush to um, decide that this is the way to go and this is what we're going to do and and that they can uh, help us to understand that this is actually going to be energy that will come back to us that will come back to Massachusetts that will indeed mm -hmm. fill that gap that we need and I will ask when I get back to the legislature in January should the good people of this district decide to send me there that the first thing we need to do is to ask how much energy are we talking about because I don't believe that we really have a handle on that and that certainly would beg the question of do we need to rush into it when we don't even know how much energy we will need over, you know, over the next five years, over the next ten years as we move to clean energy economy. So, All right. Well, thank, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Um, we had. Um, did you have? Did you have other points? No, I didn't. Well, it was yeah. just some questions on it, and, and, and one of them was um, looking at that process again. I think there's eight points in time where we can actually interject. Um, just trying to figure out how we track that when we can interject. Is there, and uh, talking with Carol, who's our agent for the uh, Conservation Commission, is there, whether it's a panel or some sort of subcommittee, to actually stay on top of where the process is at and when our opportunities are coming up? Um, yeah. And along the second part of that question was, you know, who's our best you know. contact at, at the state level, who's our best contact at the federal level? Uh, my guess would filter everything just through the selection, but just well, the question yeah, and, for, you know, and I think, looking for information. I, I think, Don, you know, I, I don't think, you know, I, I, I don't think, for example, this, this pre-filing is going to slip past us, but there's nothing to do right, at that right. stage, but they are then going to have their open houses allegedly right, and right. These, these scoping meetings. And I think, but but to the point, I mean, one one issue that occurs to me that is, is sort of a Bolton unique issue is that from Bolton's perspective, it's helpful to identify alternative routes yes. for the Worcester yes. lateral. That isn't necessarily help Clinton, but, or, or Boylston, as, but, but that is something that it's certainly the process um, invites, FERC is definitely wants the companies to look at alternative routes and they're gonna look at alternative routes and it, you know, it strikes me that it may be worthwhile to, to it, have a group in, in tech, in town sort of charged with saying, all right, here are some better ways to do it. Here are, you know, abandoned railroad lines or, or you know, 190 or, you know, to give some thought to that. I don't know, what, what do you, you have any, that's whether that uh, 
I, I mean, clearly from, well, from from our meeting where they they kind of you know kind of said, oh, there's electric easements, and there you know they they kind of took it as a kind of this odd concept that there might be other easements that they might be able to use. And from the he was the Boylston meeting, oh, there's an existing pipeline. Oh, we didn't know about that. We'll have to investigate. They're they're clearly they took a map, drew a line, and said that's where we're going to go. Now they're just kind of nudging it around to to accommodate. Um, you know the facts on the ground. They really haven't looked at a a, a, pl a plan that minimizes the impact on on, on the communities. It, this actually happens quite frequently with with notices of intent to come to the conservation commission. These people sketch out what they'd like to do, and then they discover that it crosses resource boundaries or wetland boundaries. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then, of course, one of the first questions we ask is, Have you considered alternative implementations? That wouldn't affect right. conservation yeah. lands or or, or wetlands or whatever, and I think that's not only inappropriate, but one of the first questions that we would ask in this case. And I would, uh, I, I, I would first of all uh, recognize that uh, the honorable representative Hogan has mentioned uh, choosing alternative modes like existing right of ways as an alternative. Uh, I wonder whether the re the legislature, in general, could help. <coughs> Cause such routes to be the preferred routes for such enterprises. Um, and I, would have, I think a lot of. Uh, and, and, I, and I think that that, there, that the executive offices also would be very important in, in these discussions. That their knowledge of the area um, met with the, on the state level and also the local level to look at what alternatives might be there. I definitely feel that making that cross with the with the crayon across and saying this is it they they're just going through land that i feel like they really don't understand what they're going to both come up against and what they would actually be going through um, in terms of open space in terms of wetlands in terms of conservation land and I, and I think that there is going to be a process you know that there will definitely be a reaction to that by the executive offices and certainly by the legislature well actually i take a slightly different tact i get this is not the first time that they've done this. I believe that they draw the line with the crayon because they believe that's the easiest and shortest yeah. way to get from point A to point B. Cheapest. They probably already know that looking at alternative routes going down 495 and 190 and old railroad beds and everything else is probably much more expensive and time consuming for them in the long run. So I, I, I don't think that they don't know. I think they're, they're yeah. Well, maybe. <laughs> I would say that it's like, but they did. They did acknowledge that the the uh, Worcester lateral is not the shortest way to get to wherever they're going in, right. in Shrewsbury, but that it's a less populated area, so it's easier for them right. to right. to push it through. Right. <laughs> they're running through fewer people's backyards and more people's orchards. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Can I ask Landed. a question yeah. of uh, Kate? Okay, sure. I'm going to pick up on something that I think I heard you say when you're talking about they aren't necessarily our partner for a date for the dance. Mm -hmm. Does that mean that, say, someone says, oh, yes, we do need X amount of energy, that's absolutely true, that would there be a push from anywhere to look at a source besides the pipeline? Like, like well, that would be my understanding is you look at all the possibilities and look at all of the, the you know, potentially interested parties in creating you know alternatives to to the pipeline um, but that's a, that's an entire process in and of itself I mean again that's why I go back to how much energy do we need and how do we want to approach it from either a regional or a statewide level and, and and you know sort of all enter into it knowing what we're what we what we're needing and where we want to go with it thank you and, and there's also another pipeline family there's a whole the Algonquin mm -hmm. pipeline is a sort of a parallel exactly. universe yeah. Nancy? The, other, the other question I don't hear too much about is, what about storage? In, in the very beginning of this, they were talking about storing it, like this big gas tank there in Boston. I haven't heard anything at, at all about that again. Mm -hmm. I keep hearing pipelines, pipelines, but the, the, store, the storage store. is in a pipe that's 100, 100 miles long. No, no, no. It, I know what I'm saying. That's what their storage is. I know, mm -hmm. but I'm saying storage facilities. The, I, I, think, I think their current plan is not to have I understand one. That, but right. one, of the, that they one of the many alternatives would be is this shortage really a seasonal thing that's you know, what I'm this saying. time of year and in the dead of winter but spring and fall 
they could be using that pipeline to fill you know some of the big storage That's tanks somewhere right? about storage mm -hmm. tanks. no because it's not giving them the extra capacity no, from to the legislature okay, from the various well, yeah. committees i'm just asking kate if that has been part of the conversations not, a, not the current conversations i'm uh, sure there have been unknown yeah. conversations maybe that, that may be one of the other dates that that, uh, that we want to consider okay i'm done <laughs> Uh, I can answer two of the questions. Uh, Algonquin is the other system coming in. Um, they are working on a competitive pro uh, project. <clears throat> um, if Kinder Morgan can be held up long enough and Algonquin has a chance to get their project in front of FERC, there will be competition. So that will be helpful to us. <clears throat> on storage, um, there's no reasonable way to store uh, any reasonable amount of gas other than as a liquid as an LNG tank or in a salt cavern. There's no salt caverns. Um, LNG projects are going to be independent and apart from the pipeline. So there will be no storage in the project. There's just <coughs> physically no way to do it. You, you can't do it in a pressurized tank. To, they're just not big enough. And, and I'm sorry, could you just identify yourself? You're obviously I'm very knowledgeable I'm about the business. Hmm? Uh, I'd like to work in the business. <laughs> <laughs> if, if that's okay with you. Uh, the um, well, I uh, you know that's that's uh, I, I I think going forward, I mean, we our preference is that that folk, folks who, who speak at the meetings identify themselves, but I but we're not going to press you. Sharon, <laughs> um, I think it's Sharon Chappella. Um, one of the things I think it's important for us to remember is that uh, the consultants, Black and Vetch, who were hired by the New England governors uh, to come up with this estimate of energy needs, um, were not actually asked to uh, estimate what would be the energy needs were we to devote an equivalent amount of money or some set, some set of money to reduce our energy needs rather than to meet them with a pipeline or with the with uh, natural gas so anything that we can do to address um, to slow down this process to impede their progress we know that uh, the kingdom morgan is planning on uh, sending in or, or submitting their initial proposal to FERC in september uh, David can tell us exactly how long we have. I think it's what five maybe five weeks to sign for anyone to sign on uh, to be a legitimate uh, party to that proposal. So it's we can they will have public comments. But if you want to have any kind of party control of that, you only have five weeks from the time they submit. Uh, to You're talking about the pre-application? Yes, the pre-application. So David can, can actually explain this better than I can on this. But I'm just saying that, that we have more than, I think we should be looking at more than how to mitigate an inevitable pipeline through Bolton. And look at whether or not it would be in our better interest to do what we can to either slow down, to significantly slow down the process so that we can have an intelligent design or a conversation about an alternatives that might make us, might get us to the goal that we want, which is adequate energy for our needs uh, in a way which is perhaps um, better overall for the environment we are well on our way, in an interesting way, we're well on our way to uh, lowering our energy needs. The governors have really done a good job of promoting uh, ways of reducing energy needs. Why would we stop in this process or not, not, not put an emphasis on that process um, and in the meantime go through with a pipeline which even they, Kinder Morgan themselves, in a, a conversation, a quarterly conversation with their stockholders, estimated that up to 80% of all of the uh, gas that will go through that pipeline will go for exportation. A, up to 80%. This is not helping 
Yep. No, I, you're, I think you're, you're, you're preaching to the choir here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the, but I've um, heard just so much conversation about how can we mitigate this and not not how could we strategically um, slow it. Mr. Down. Chairman, if I if I just like to hmm? remind that Representative Hogan said correctly that at the meeting we had in Berlin. The prime objective that we were trying to pursue is to try to slow things down as much as possible. So that's a direction we're already taking. Mm -hmm. The um, we had um, we talked at our last meeting that about a, a, a resolution that the the select board would consider, and um, Don Lowe did a lot of work putting one together. Um, and there was some folks asked if they could see this in advance. I was still working on on some proposed changes through this morning. And, and I'm going to read what sort of my uh, my edits of, of what had, was a document largely based on what Don had done. And so this is a this is a, a at this point just a, a proposed resolution by the Bolton Board of Selectors. <coughs> Whereas Bolton is bisected by a 10-inch natural gas pipeline, which is more than 35 years old, that is operated by Tennessee Gas Pipeline LLC, a subsidiary of Kinder Morgan Inc. And whereas Kinder Morgan has proposed a new 30-inch high-pressure gas pipeline through northern Massachusetts as part of a proposed Northeast Direct Energy project. And whereas the project also proposes a new 12-inch natural gas pipeline to be installed in Bolton and neighboring towns, connecting the existing Bolton pipeline with a location on the Worcester Shrewsbury line, known as the Worcester Lateral. And whereas Kinder Morgan has identified properties in Bolton that it intends the Worcester Lateral to cross, but has declined to provide the town of Bolton with detailed and current information on the route it is proposing. And whereas it appears that Kinder Morgan is proposing that the Worcester Lateral cross some of the most historic, scenic, and environmentally sensitive farmland and open space in Bolton, including conservation land owned by the town of Bolton. And whereas a high pressure gas pipeline by its nature carries the potential for leak rupture or devastating explosion, causing untold damage to properties and lives. And whereas the project and the Worcester Lateral will destroy large amounts of forest, wetlands, conservation land, and farmland and require maintenance in perpetuity of a 30 to 50 foot right of way. And whereas the Worcester Lateral would adversely affect property values, adversely affect residents' livelihood, and otherwise negatively impact the integrity of the town's scenic character. And whereas our energy challenges are better addressed through investments in energy conservation measures as well as green and renewable energy solutions. And whereas Bolton and our neighboring communities have adopted comprehensive master plans, zoning bylaws, wetland bylaws, and other land use controls to provide for orderly development of our communities and the conservation and protection of our communities for future generations to come as good stewards of the land should. And whereas the elimination of environmental threats to our forests and streams from improvident development is a fundamental purpose for the adoption of our land use controls and master plans. And whereas Bolton and our neighboring communities have publicly and privately set aside large tracts of land and restricted their development for conservation and open space purposes as part of their master plans. Now therefore, be it resolved that the Board of Selectmen of Bolton hereby declare that they stand in opposition to Kinder Morgan's Northeast Direct Energy Project and to the Worcester Lateral, and stand in opposition to all similar projects that may later be proposed, and stand in opposition to any efforts to locate any portion of Worcester Lateral within Bolton's borders, and will participate in and provide comments to any scoping meetings held, held by the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission with regard to the Worcester Lateral that question the need for the new pipeline and identify alternative routes outside of Bolton, and will seek to intervene in any proceeding before the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission which seeks a certificate of public necessity and convenience with regard to the Worcester Lateral and oppose Kinder Morgan's application. And be it further resolved that the Board of Selectmen of Bolton hereby call upon our state and federal legislators and executive branch officers to enact legislation and take any other actions as are necessary to oppose such energy projects <coughs> that go against our commitment to public safety, the environment, our economic well-being, and sense of community. Well. Well done.
Are you sure that's strong enough? <laughs> <laughs> well, I we, yeah. we'll take that as an okay. <laughs> Sign it. <laughs> <laughs> I think the only clause that I wasn't wild about in, in this otherwise very good thing was the fourth one where um, they've deca declined to provide detailed and current information on the route it's proposing. It just seems a little bit, I mean, even, you know, if they came and said this is where we're going, that, you know, and that really takes away from, you know, our overall dislike for the project. I thought it's a nice loose yeah. I, 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 I agree with you, but I'm not sure I'm not sure it quite goes with the rest of the rest It is accurate. I, I'm, not, I'm not disputing that. I just, yeah. just wasn't quite sure I, you know. yeah. But that being said, I'm happy with it as is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Is there a motion? No, I'm fine. Is there a motion? Hmm? Yeah, so this time. <laughs> I think someone else had a no. question. I no, I know. Oh, okay. I, I was just going to say at the uh, Lunenburg meeting, the Lunenburg selectman actually asked for asking to Morgan for a list of people they had called. Given it's a dynamic process, you know they can't know who they're going to call or where the pipeline's going to be. But who had they called already? And Kinder Morgan gave them a long answer. The selectman stood back up and he said, "So are you saying no?" And Kinder Morgan said, "No, we won't give you a list." So I don't know that it. I think it needs to be in there. Okay. <laughs> that is a problem. Yeah. Okay. I, I would say that it's a nice resolution, but to only focus it on the Worcester lateral is uh, short-sighted. The selectman should oppose the pipeline total. Well, you know, I actually we, it does. It does. It does. And it's it, it's it, there is some focus on the Worcester lateral, but but it's. It's a pro when the project was defined as the whole big thing, and within it, and so it. Um, it's not it's like it, 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 yeah. it, it did say that we stand in opposition to yeah. the northeast direct, which is the, yeah. the entire yeah. project. Right. And, and so, if it were to be, be routed someplace else, you would still be opposed to it. Not looking for alternative routes for this pipeline, but you're opposed to this pipeline anywhere. It's not necessary at all. The big pipeline is not necessary. The, the Worcester lateral is not necessary. And it, even if it goes through Clinton and Boylston, it's not necessary. But we particularly don't want to go through Bolton. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, that was my only concern is that you do indicate that we want, you know, we don't really want it to go through our neighbors, but that would be better than Bolton. And I think <laughs> no. that that. We don't want it to go through anywhere. I, we, no, we don't want to hand this problem to any of our neighbors. And some of our neighbors who are not affected by the pipeline are also supporting us who are, which is part of this. No, I think it's a, it, it, you're right. It's a zero sum game. Somebody, if, if the pipeline goes elsewhere, but we've got landowners in Bolton, we have these farms that we're trying to preserve. And I think at some point, if it came down to that question, it's there's a Worcester lateral and there, there's a route through. Bolton and there's a route somewhere else, I think, I understand, you don't want either of them, but if there's got to be one of them, let's let's not go through Nancy Case's farm. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and Larry, I thought you did address that in there. Very first. Did. 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 Yeah. Did. 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 It's a second whereas and it's in the result. Oh, okay. right. Yeah. 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 Well, I have a question or a comment uh, as a lawyer. Uh, and Awfully anxious that you pass this tonight. It's been before the town for two months now since Kinder's mm -hmm. presentation. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's terribly important, I think, that Bolton would stand up with the other towns that have taken action. And, and, so, and so I think it's a fine resolution, and I hope they'll pass it. And, but uh, let's remember what Groton did. They uh, <coughs> passed a resolution early on. This is not early on, but it's, and it's a better resolution than they were working with. But anyway, and then they came back and they passed an amended one or an, or an additional one after they got some legal advice. And uh, what I want to say is, as a lawyer, that if you look at FERC decisions, they have to make certain uh, findings that whatever it is is in the public interest uh, before they permit eminent domain, which will let a private company take private land away from 
to private owners for private purposes. They have to ask to be findings of uh, public interest and as you very wisely have in the resolution, public convenience and necessity, and they also have to consider the cumulative impact. And so what I would like to suggest is that uh, the town take up with uh, the town council uh, the possibility of just doing some research, uh, if he hasn't already, on FERC decisions and how to, to, to uh, handle a FERC uh, hearings and, and FERC decisions and how to uh, plant the seeds that will permit you to um, uh, take it to court if FERC goes the wrong way. And, uh, and ask the town council either to give specific recommendations of how you can disprove um, uh, how Bolton uh, can disprove that it's in the public interest in Bolton, and how it, Bolton can disprove that it's a, a public convenience and necessity in Bolton. And uh, maybe town council could uh, ask, could, could, could seek a few hours of um, consultation with uh, an energy lawyer who was an expert on, on how you handle a FERC situation, because what we're going to get to once they file, which may be next week. Uh, no, it's not going to be next. It's going to be next year. Well, Don't I, all I can say is they have announced. The pre they have announced. is completely different than the file. Yeah, well, there it's are stages, and I don't claim to be an expert on on, on all of on all of that. But they are going to be before for starting in the next four weeks. Right, and but that is there not. Will be you know, I yeah. I have read FERC decisions, and I understand the FERC process. And this initial stage, I is this pre-filing. It starts with open houses are required by FERC, which are company things where they're trying to be nice people. Then FERC. Her, FERC employees have these scoping sessions where they want people to raise issues, raise alternative routes. That's all pre-application. The application is going to come a year from today. And at that point, there there is, as we say in the resolution, we should be intervening. And I think you're right, we should get, you know. Yeah. We're not in any kind of disagreement. I'm just saying, thanks for doing what you hope, I hope you're doing tonight. The next to help you'll go on to the next step, which is, I believe, requires some specific energy lawyer uh, advice with the th very specific thought in mind of when the time comes, whether it's in a short time or a year from now, when the time comes to be before FERC at the critical moment and prove it's not in the public interest and it's not for the public convenience and necessity in this town uh, that will be prepared, our governing body will be prepared to, to come up with very specific examples like uh, herbicides. They won't, they won't, they say, well, we'll, we'll talk to individual property owners and the property owner says we don't want herbicides, we won't put herbicides on their property. But if you ask them, do you pray that you won't have any herbicides in Bolton, they won't promise that. Where do every single house in this town gets it, its water from a well? and the wells all come out of the Bolton aquifer and herbicides will poison the aquifer sooner or later and so this is a, a you know just one of a number of very local very specific uh, arguments that could be made if time and effort is made in advance so we're ready to do it at the right time. Uh, I mentioned that, that the, the forum they had in Lunenburg the questioner in the audience asked Alan Four of, of Kinder Morgan, have you ever been denied a project which you submitted for application to FERC? And the answer was no. But sometimes we don't go ahead with projects which are preliminary projects because they just didn't work out. There are lots of them. I don't think if we want to wait until Kinder Morgan files their official filing with FERC to begin opposition of this pipeline in the pre-file, there's the place for you to be an intervener, for you to put in. Uh, I don't think you can intervene at the pre-file. No, so well, there's opportunities. Well, you, you, you can you, you can, can comment in the scoping comment. sessions, well, which is what we. You, you can yes, submit. Yeah, yeah. yeah, we can yeah. talk about some of that stuff too. Um, as part of their pre-filing, yeah. one of the things they have to do is go to NEPA, <clears throat> and NEPA is going to seek input from the towns, especially on conservation areas. Um, and I, I don't know if we can yeah. talk about that quickly now, but. 
one of the things that we're struggling with because it is so difficult to figure out where the line's going to know how it will all come down is should we pre-evaluate the land? In other words, should we hire somebody to come in and count the vernal pools and note the topography and really do a full survey of all that land so as the process goes along, it gives us a stronger argument to what's there and we know what we need to protect. In order to do that, though, we're gonna have to budget up, uh, a budget. Um, it's just gonna be a professional service that we didn't have budgeted. Mm -hmm. um, but then there's the question if we can find out where FERC falls in the process, that it might be something that, that falls under Chapter 4450, Section 53G, where it's something we can charge Kenya Morgan to do. Uh, but we might not know that till too far along in the process that we might need to just have to talk about spending the money to, to survey it all now. Mm -hmm. um, just something to consider. All right, well, we're, we're a little beyond our. Uh, our schedule time, even though we started early. <laughs> well, I will move that we adopt the uh, resolution as previously read. I'll second that. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Yes. Aye. 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 Mr. Chairman, I've, uh, once we have the, the signed copy, Bravo. Linda will uh, Linda will, will scan it and uh, we'll email it to Representative Hogan's office, who's agreed to uh, or offered, I should say, to kind of quarterback this and forward it on to all the appropriate uh, state agencies and um, political figures. Great. Right, from the governor Great. on down. Thank you. And also to uh, uh, to the congressional. That's right. And, and our U.S. Senators as well. We'll, yeah. we'll cover everything. All right. Well, great. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Nancy, you want yeah. a I final have, word? <laughs> I'm all the way out of order, I know, but I have an announcement to make. We asked if it would be okay if we had a landlord in a butters meeting amongst the town, just to make sure everybody's happy about it. This is way back at your last meeting. It is planned. It's September 11th. And we're very, very happy to have Rose Wessel, who founded um, no Fret Gas and Mass, and Katie Eisman, who is uh, the director of, plan of Mass Plan and the uh, legal coordinator. So we are very pleased to have both those speakers. The place is not announced yet, but it's 7 o'clock, and we hope very much that owners and, and the others will come, and we are spreading this word to Berlin, Boston, and Northbrook. And I really hope we can have kind of a packed house. We were trying to get to church. I don't, we can't do it in some small room. I have no idea how many people are coming. Mm -hmm. But if they are coming, we definitely want a lot of people. It's a quite time to answer, ask your questions. Is it true? They have tremendous knowledge on a lot of different things. And we'll give you, if they don't know the answer, they'll send you somewhere. And please don't think that they're a bunch of fanatics. Larry, we can stand up for a <laughs> Oh, no, no, <laughs> they're you, very, no, very they're, I think they're, there's a lot of, both those organizations have a lot of good information, and your, the individuals you name are their, uh, some of their heavy hitters. Yes, they are. They are. Yeah. All right. Our next item is an update on access to Persons Park. I don't know if we have any parks and rec members here. No. I'm the newly minted chair of Parks and Rec. Congratulations. Did you miss the meeting? Is that what happened? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was the new guy. That's what happened. I know. Yeah. I know. Yeah. <laughs> um, Don, you want to bring us up to speed on the uh, which Persons Park? Yeah, well, thank you. Um, yes, yeah, we we we've been discussing Persons Park for a while. We, we've had some issues with um, people accessing um, the water going down the slope, I mean, which they've been allowed to do. Nobody's done anything wrong. But over time, you know, it's caused erosion to the hill. It's uh, damaging tree roots. Uh, it actually damaged uh, an electrical wire as well. 
and um, we, we, we have an access road that was originally uh, put in there for the sole purpose of allowing people to access the, uh, the, the pond via that mechanism and about three years ago it was it was gated off and it's been my thinking that we I think we would be better I think the site would be better served to place boulders at that slope so that you can't drive down mm -hmm. that hill concurrently with reopening that access road and having the controlled access going down that way um, in conjunction with that one of the other issues that we've had over there is we have had people over there at night that shouldn't be there doing things that they shouldn't be doing so I, I've already spoken, spoken with, with Chief Alfano. We have stepped up patrols in that area and we'll be stepping them up even more. So we're gonna have a much greater um, increase in police presence over there. So I think we can address the uh, access uh, concern by placing the boulders. In. Harold actually has the boulders sitting ready to go. All I have to do is- Stand, The boulders are standing by. Uh, are standing by. We, I can give them the only full tomorrow and we'll have them in place tomorrow. He actually has the uh, key for the lock, so we don't have to cut it and ruin a perfectly good <laughs> lock. Uh, we will put up temporary uh, a temporary sign that directs people to the road, and we'll have a more professional sign in a few weeks. But but we we'll, we have a temporary sign ready to go as well. Um, I've spoken with um, the uh, uh, person with the Boy Scouts uh, who, who was responsible for Camp Resolute. Uh, he 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 did say he had no specific concerns with this. He did ask that we do have the increased police presence because there have been issues over there. And um, at, at first he was slightly concerned about the road being reopened, but I reminded him that the road had been used for years and the Boy Scout camp has been there for years. Yeah, years. And you know, I asked him if we had any specific issues because of the road and we had not. So I, to me, it's the most logical way to, to proceed right now to try to get at, mm -hmm. at some security issues over there and help prevent any further erosion of the hill. No, it sounds, yeah, it sounds like it makes, it it makes perfect yeah. sense. And I, yeah. I, I, I think I recall that this, there's actually an easement that goes with the property that uses that road. So sure. I mean, we, have, we have a right to we, use that. It is our road, yes. We, we have the right to use that, right. absolutely. It, um, yeah. yeah, no, no, I, yeah. I, I, think, that, I think that makes, makes perfect sense. So, yeah. yeah. So I don't know how long I get to claim new guy. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Five minutes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> What's your name? Steve Schneider. Thank you. Um, I think one concern that Joyce brought up, and Joyce has been on the on the, the commission for a little while, was uh, apparently, and, and Chief, maybe you can. I know she's she's spoken to you about this, which is uh, traffic actually from the, the Boy Scout property crossing that area and using... using I, I have spoken with the Boy Scouts about that as well. Okay. And um, I, I, I did speak to the representative. He did say that, um, well, first of all, they do have the right to cross the property mm -hmm. there. Uh, I did ask them to, I did ask him to remind anyone who drives a vehicle down there uh, to use proper care and caution in, in, in crossing. Um, I didn't, I don't say, that, I didn't say that they were speeding. I just said, would you please give them a reminder of what proper care and caution is, and he said he would. So he, he, he said he would get that message out. Okay. I didn't know if we could ask them to, since they're Boy Scouts, you know, just make some, I don't know, five mile an hour signs, post them, you know, just to remind those that, that are crossing the area to, to take it easy. It could even be, you know, made of wood. Um, I think that might be a, you know, if, because that was that was one of Joyce's main concerns was you know you're you're opening the access up, you're allowing people to unload their canoes, kayaks, whatnot. Um, you're you're in a sense um, uh, not guaranteeing, but you're you're inviting them to do this and, and in a way uh, saying it's a safe place to do this, and then you know a vehicle comes screaming by. Mm. Well, they are doing it now, and they're going down there with vehicles now. The only difference is how they're going to access it. Right. So. Um, but but the vehicles screaming by are those those are tractors or something yes. that the yeah. Boy Scouts have? I mean, between Boy Scouts and the Cub Scouts. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah because so I guess the land is in between. Yeah, yeah they so, the, yeah. they own both sides right. of right. the property. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. right. Yeah. So you know, we, you know, we did have that discussion. I don't know if we put signs up other than a caution sign 
uh, caution vehicles entering or something like that. I don't you know. Mm -hmm. I don't know that we know what an appropriate miles per hour is or something like that. But you know, some sort of signage. You know, again, I, I could speak to Harold and ask her to put something yeah. up down there. Yeah. 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 Oh, no. No, I think that. Would be pedestrian crossings or something yeah yeah, yeah. Okay. <coughs> you know i always have something to say <laughs> <laughs> um, just um in, in reviewing because as you know we from the police standpoint do have some concerns because the type of individuals that we have been encountering recently at persons park have uh, not really been savory people um, Martha, mostly. No, Martha. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're finding an increase in, uh, in homeless people camping up there. Uh, we've had warrant arrests out of there with people armed with knives. Um, I ran, this week I ran a computer uh, study on our statistics. Last year, 2013, we had four incidents or interactions with persons at that location. Four. This year, to date, We've had 52. Wow. Now, out of those 52, part of that increase is we have increased patrols up there. So naturally, if we're up there more, we'll have more interaction finding people. But I think that's an important figure, four to 52 yeah. in less than a year. So there's a lot more activity up there that we're seeing. Um, one of the issues which I think would be very important and very helpful to us, and I, I did discuss it with, with Park and Rec, is similar to Bauer Springs, we really need a good sign, a very clear, visible, and explicit sign at the entrance to that facility stating the hours and when it's closed. Because it's really unclear at the moment up there, there really is not good signage. So I think we really need to have a very specific sign right at the entrance so if people do go in there after dark when it's closed, according to the bylaws, that they know that. And what that does is that's more of an enforcement tool for us if we do catch somebody in there after hours, we can say, did you see the sign, you're a trespass? Absolutely, if, if, if Park and Rec were to establish the hours of, of uh, well, the hours well, that people would, are permitted to be there. Well, there's a sign that they yield the vigil for that. You're right, you're right, you're right. Park, park, you're right. Park, you're right. Yeah. Park, yeah. park Rec basically handed the land back to the Board of Selectmen. So, <laughs> <laughs> so if the Board of Selectmen would like to consider establishing appropriate hours of use, well, whether it's dawn to dusk or specific hours or what have you. Uh, I think Chief Alfano's right, you know, when we have something posted and people are clearly violating it, they can't say they didn't know. Yeah. What's, it up at Bowers, what's it up at Bauer Springs, Chief? Pardon me? What's it up at Bauer Springs? Bauer Springs, and I'll use Bauer Springs as really sort of a, a, a perfect template of access. We don't have issues at Bauer Springs, and it's, it's a very extensive area, as you all know, up off of Harvard Road with trails. Uh, there's a couple reasons for that. Number one, there's very specific signage up there. It's very clear signage. Number two, there's a parking area for vehicular access so that vehicles can't get way down into the hinterland, so to speak, at night. There's a very specific area and then, and then it's gated where they go in. So not quite the same layout as Persons Park, because at Persons Park you have the dock with the bolt ramp. But what does the signage say as far as hours go is a question. Uh, I can't remember specific <clears throat> times on that. Why don't you just say closed at dark? Closed when it's dark. Yeah, but it's, it's good signage and we have no issues up there. If I came in with the computer statistics for the type of problems we have up there, we don't have any. So it's a, it's, that park is a good model, I think, for the rest of the... Well, we should the check the signs. The dawn to dusk really will cover all the mm -hmm. seasons yeah. and whatnot. You know? Yeah, no, yeah. I think that's... Yeah, it just assists us because right, then, you know, those arrest laws for trespassing kick in, so... Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. All right. Chief, I know that resources are stretched, but would there be a way to close that access? At dusk, we we looked at that. As a matter of fact, Dawn and I spoke about that. And it's with the limited resources we have to actually have a police officer have to go and open and close a, a gate every night. Sure, um, that's not something we could promise that we could do because if they get tied up in an accident or they're tied up at a at a call, it, 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 it I think it would be an imposition on the officers to do. I mean, it kind of goes on both sides. So it's getting there in the evening to close and to, open, to right. make sure that everybody's. Out well, before yeah, you lock it, right. and then getting, the, getting yeah. back there in the morning to open it for anybody that wants to go down, yeah. you know, early morning fishing or whatever they, you know, whatever the case may yeah, be. We, we just don't uh, have staff to do that. Don, would it be inappropriate to approach the Boy Scouts and see if 
when camp is in session that they might be willing to, you know, at Reveille go out and open the open the gate. And yeah, I would rather see the town be responsible for its own domain. Yeah. yeah. But again, it's just just something to keep in mind. Again, based on the Bower Spring model, you wouldn't have to have a locked and unlocked gate if there was a small parking area very close to, in other words, where the driveway goes in. If you had a small cutout for a parking area, we would notice any vehicles that are in there. And unless somebody was launching a canoe, it really wouldn't cause a, an imposition to any vehicle. We don't really have the footprint for that in there, though. Yeah. Plus, they could still bypass it and go on down anyway. Mm -hmm. There isn't anything to prevent them from doing that. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah, if, we, if we can see them, if they're visible, it's a lot easier to enforce. Yeah. The vehicles, it's the vehicles. Those are the problems we're having. And we, we have found a lot of drug activity up there. Do we need a motion about the uh, please the stones and the uh, stones. <laughs> stones. <Yeah. laughs> stones and signs? Yeah, I, I uh, <laughs> move that we um, authorize the uh, oh, that's what I want to do here. Um, that we open the the access road gate, um, the personal part to to get down to the water, um, place boulders at the top of the hill to prevent traffic. Uh, going down that way, add signs directing traffic down the access road and improve the signage on as far as the um, park being open from dawn till dusk and uh, being there at night is, uh, or when, when dark is <coughs> trespassing. Or some, some appropriate wording to that effect. I'll second that. <laughs> <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. We have one. Uh -huh. okay. Excuse me, uh, Administrator Long. Um, is Brownie going to put those stones so they won't eliminate the two parking places that are there next to the cabin, but not at the top of the hill? Yes, you should. Yeah, we, so we should be able to make. We'll it. still have some. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very Great. much. Thank, Thank you. You. Nice. you can no longer be a newbie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can that time. That was really stuff. We are now to the uh, town administrator's report. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and of course, that leads with the leads with the always popular <laughs> and interesting update. I I think Minuteman promises to be the shortest discussion point in the entire update. Um, I will just say that we uh, the the building committee is going to start meeting again. I believe September 15th is our next meeting. And we are marching forward with the uh, number of 628 for a, a student population. Mm -hmm. so, uh, that's been, I believe, uh, approved by MSP. So everything is working towards that. Uh, we did have one town manager's meeting to discuss whether or not we could uh, come up with a standard uh, intermunicipal agreement for non-community, non-district communities to come in and avail themselves uh, of the facility we spent for about two hours <laughs> covered a lot of ground um, noted some areas that we need some clarity on we're going to circle back and meet again i believe it's um september 11th again in western so in about two weeks and i'm hoping we can complete that that work then there's a lot of interest to in try to get this done now, almost every community was represented at that meeting so some communities have multiple representatives there but we're, we're all pretty much on the same page so I, I was really pleased with that. Um, next, uh, the update on Fiveshire. Fiveshire Dam is progressing very well. Actually, quite pleased with it. Um, the, um, the the new dam is in place, along with the reinforced turf mat. Um, the contractor is waiting for the grass to come in a little more, and then we'll be able to drive over to remove the coffer dam. Uh, the contractor's next steps are to build a new walkway, loam and seed distributed, I'm uh, sorry, disturbed areas, install wetland plantings and install plants to screen the disturbed area between the Berlin neighbor and the construction site, and finally provide new, uh, a new driveway uh, to the Berlin neighbors and seal the, uh, uh, to one Berlin neighbor and seal the common driveway, which is all part of the quoted, quoted scope of work. Mm -hmm. Uh, we're estimated we're about two-thirds complete. Most of the heavy equipment work is finished, and uh, they appear to be on schedule to be completed in, in September. Great. So good. I'm very, very happy with that. Um, update on the Houghton building. 
the uh, painting of the Houghton building is complete, um, I, uh, including the uh, ramp access. Um, very, very pleased with it. I, I've been over to look at it. Linda and I have both gone over to look at it. I've been over a couple of times. I think they did a really good job. Uh, again, that low bidder, uh, the, the base bid was $29,500. And when we went out for bid this time last year, when we looked at doing fall work, we were in the 80s and 90s. You know, so we, it, so it, it's, a, it's a good example of when you go out to bid in, in the fall, you're gonna get really high prices and contractors are hungry in the spring. Um, the change orders were minimal. We expected change orders because we expected some rock to be found yes. so that some carpentry would, would need to be done. The um, total amount on change orders for carpentry was $4,300, which Harold and I both thought was reasonable. And one additional change order, which was done at, at our request. Um, while they were there, we wanted to, we had considered um, the removal of antennas from the roof. You know, they had all the high equipment there, why not have them do that? And we trimmed back some of the trees that were close to the building, you know, to create a little bit of space there. That was 1920. So for round numbers, uh, $6,200 in change orders uh, to, to 29 we got the whole thing done for 35 7 35 8 something like that. So I think it, I think it was a job well done, and, and we can't complain about the price. What was the amount that had been authorized at town meeting? Ninety-two, if I remember right. No, I think it was nine. I think the article was ninety-two. Okay. So yeah, we're well within the article. We have plenty of money that can be redirected in you know, during budget time next year. Pretty good. Um, next uh, update on potential recall bylaw. As you will recall, back in the spring, we talked about um, in, plan, in planning for the next annual town meeting. To, since we don't have a recall bylaw on the books right now, that maybe now would be a good time to work on one because we have no known controversies going on, <laughs> <laughs> um, and that we could we could follow this type of path without looking like it was you know we're going after you know anyone or any any sort of vendetta. Just try to be proactive and have one in place if God forbid we ever do need one. So uh, Pam Powell went off and went through general code and gleamed. Um, nine communities that she thought were, were, were good comparable communities and uh, she made a copy of all the bylaws for me we sat down went through them together collectively um, we came up with this matrix which I'm still working on but just some of the uh, key, key decision points are uh, the number of voters to initiate a process by filing to initiate the process by filing an affidavit number of days that uh, needs to be returned, within which it needs to be returned to the town clerk, then the percentage of registered voters' signatures required on the actual, um, for the actual uh, election to be called. That Wait, what's the percentage? Uh, it's very interesting. Um, the low percentage was 15%, which is what I, I expected to see 15%. The high percentage was 30%. Wow, and that's a lot of signatures. A lot of signatures, yeah. and I thought, was something that for me was incongruous and I'm not, I don't want to specifically name the town but there's <laughs> one, one town at 25 percent which I thought was high and had the shortest number or shortest time frame in which to get them which was 14 days yeah. wow. so and and Pam and I felt that when we do our actual recommendation later on in the year because we've already gone over all the key points so we actually agreed on every one of them uh, we thought 20 days with 15 percent was reasonable now, a couple of things just for you to consider. You don't necessarily need, a, need a, uh, uh, an answer tonight, but some towns felt that um, if, a, uh, if an incumbent were recalled, that um, they didn't need to go off and get signatures. They were automatically placed on the ballot. Others felt that they should have to go off and get signatures just, just like everyone else, which is what I would recommend. I, I don't think you should automatically have well, to. Well, but we've got, you know, what's our 20 signatures? I mean, is all we normally require if, you, if you're not nominated by the caucus. Right. You know, it's. Oh, you know. um, that would only be, well, I mean, so isn't it, it's, it's really kind of a two stage process, isn't it? It's first you have to get recalled, and then right. there's then a special election to. And I guess my, my take would be once you've been recalled, you know, if you lose a recall mm -hmm. vote, 
you're no longer in that position. Well, so I'll, you're not I'll you're no longer an incumbent to no but, 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 for, the, but for the actual yeah. recall election itself. Okay. The question is, is the person being recalled automatically on the ballot or would they go off and get their signatures just as anyone who was challenging them? So is there just so there's just one vote, which is basically do you want to recall and if so, right. who do you want to take their place? Right. Do you want to recall Don Lowe? Yes or no? Then there's Don Lowe uh, is he automatically eligible for re-election, or does he have to get his signatures? Uh, so, so under under what circumstances would somebody say, "Yes, I want to recall down low," but then I'm going to go and, and vote for well, him he's, again? He's running against Secretary Trump's running against him. I'll vote for right, him. Right, right, but, 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 that, but then wouldn't you just say, "No, I'm not going to bother recalling." Yeah. Well, no. I mean, some yeah. some people yeah. will sign your recall. I mean, right. some some people will sign your signatures just to because they don't want to say no. But it doesn't mean they're going to vote for you once the election mm -hmm. comes. That's uh, that's a lesson of politics I right. learned years ago. Yeah. No, no, um, I mean, but I mean, if, if, it's, if it's one election, on, on one hand you're saying, am I going to recall this person or not? And if right. you say, yes, I want to recall him. But, but, but what's, no actually, actually, what's, what's actually, actually on the ballot at yeah, a recall yeah, election? It seems like it's just like a regular election. It's a regular election. There's no vote to invoke the recall. Yeah. It's just there is a, there's you, a vote. You vote to recall yes Plus or no? Make, uh, okay. Say, so say you have a well, I won't use examples of neighboring towns. <laughs> 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 so 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 there's so, so there's two but, questions on one is, do you want to recall the person? And then there's the, then there's just normal ballot of right, the person who you want to or more than one opponent depending. Yeah. 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 So then so that that that's something to consider, and then. Um, if the incumbent is recalled, then the number of days for them to resign is pretty standard at seven. Um, but but once you've got your signatures, the number of days to call the election is normally a range of days, um, anywhere from 45 to 60 to as high as um, 65 to 90. And uh, Pam and I were kind of leaning towards 65 to 75 days. But Another thing to consider is if another election is already scheduled, the proximity of that to the election. So we've looked at if, um, <laughs> and that ranges from 60 days to 100 days. So we were thinking, I, I believe, I don't want to misquote Pam, I believe we were thinking that if an election were within, if a scheduled election were within 90 days of when you would have your recall election, then you would meld it into the regular election and, and not have the expense of two elections, basically. Um, and but towards the end, I, I, I was really interested in this. Um, the amount of time in office that you need to be in before you you can be recalled. Um, a lot of communities had six months, uh, and several were silent on it. So you could be recalled day two, you know, if you had those signatures. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, the town will go from a hangover. It's like, what did we do? It yeah. seemed like you should. You, the, the person should be in office for a while before they're eligible to be recalled. Otherwise, you're just trying to overturn the results. Yeah, of the though, election. though, as yeah. a practical yeah. matter, you're not going to get 15 percent of the people who they just elected this right. this individual. What would they, what could they have done to get themselves yeah. recalled? But, but silence is open to interpretation, and some sort yeah. of numbers seem to make sense to yeah. us. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and then another decision is. If you are the subject of a recall and you prevail, so you're not recalled, can you be recalled again in the same term? Mm -hmm. And some were silent on that. Some said yes after six months of the election. And again, to our way of thinking, you get one bite of the apple per term. You know, if you're, if, if, yeah, I, would th I yeah. think that. If you're the subject sense. of a recall and and you prevail, you've the dodged recall, the bullet. You should be you, good. Right, you've dodged the bullet. That doesn't then give you. I mean, if, if, if you never, if you're not subject to another oh, recall, then, then you'll really be out then, of control. Then you're, you're, you have no, no, no check on your. Well, presuming you're reelected, <laughs> presuming then you're, you're then in your next term you're eligible again. It's just within. Well, a, but, yeah, but I can see. Yeah, but 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 if you know. in case of, we're, we're talking specific, specific, specific to the selectmen, so you know you got a three-year term, mm -hmm. you know, and and if the, the person prevails and doesn't get recalled. I don't think that that means he's, he's, that person is scot free for whatever. For two years, yeah, yeah, that might yeah. be. That might be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 be involved in. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, in a, but in a two years or so, 
you're facing an election anyway. So I guess it's yeah. you know are, you know are you going to seek re-election or not? So again, something to consider. How, how long are the planning board terms? The, five, uh, five, uh, five, uh, five, five years. years. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. Yeah. if yeah, you know, no, see, that's a good point. Yeah. I, I've been thinking three-year terms yeah. on yeah. this, but you're right. That, yeah. that, that is a good point. So, I, I mean, I, I mean, I, I would say you'll probably, you know, six months or something like that is probably a, yeah. That's a very good point. Because hmm. um, the, the only thing I had co even considered was a three-year term, and then finally, um, if you are recalled, the time until you are eligible to run in another election or be appointed to a town office, and some are silent. Um, one town said one year before you can apply for or you know, work for the town in any capacity, and several said two years. So again, it's sort of an interesting thing. How long, is there any banishment period, basically, <laughs> and, and just so how long it should be? So, a lot of, a lot yeah, of things no, to it's, it's, uh, <coughs> a lot of variables, more than you'd have. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And those are just the highlights. There are some subplots there, too. But, wow. Yeah. Um, no, this, is, this is good to have. We need this. So, uh, next, discussion regarding the current sign bylaw, which I believe we have attached. Yes. And the reason we put this on the agenda is, you know, uh, we have felt for some time that our sign bylaws are a bit weak. And one of the things that kind of raised this again for us was when the signs came up for the, uh, for the opposition for, for the pipeline. And people asked, are we allowed to put signs up? And the answer is yes. But then the question is, well, how long can they be up for? Well, there's, there is no limitation in the current bylaws for how long they can be up for. I mean, when you have campaign signs, we have language that says X number of days before the election and Y number of days after the election, I thought. No. You're giving, okay, well, we should. I mean, town, some towns do that, but we don't. Well, we okay. should. No, we definitely should. Uh, but but the bylaw is weak, so I think that's something to work on mm -hmm. again between now and the next election. The next election to, to, to try to beef that yeah, up. Yeah. Um, so I'm just, the, um, I'm just raising the point right now. And, yeah, and the proximity you know, I'm not to sure the what we can do on this sort of political speech. You know, our limits on saying you you can't. You know, you're your 350 signs or your peace signs or something. Oh, I don't believe we can put limits on political speech. But well, what that's what, isn't that what the pipeline? Well, yes, and, and yeah. you're right. So I'm not saying that we can have a duration that the signs can be out for, but we might want to consider something to the effect of maybe it should be at least six feet away from a roadway, something like that. So you're not creating a safety issue. You know, you're not putting it right on the roadway. Which could be an issue. Yeah. Maybe it's yeah. not, but it's something that I think should be considered. No, I think if if, if if a political issue such as the pipeline lasts a year, you should be entitled to have that sign on your property for a year. You know, I'm I'm not saying that, but there are other things I think to, to consider. And if we don't have limitations on campaign signs, then I think we, we I think we should have a time frame that it can't be up, say you know, 45 days before the election and must be down within 14 days after or something like that. You know, just to throw numbers out. I, I, I don't think yeah, that's I mean, it to, Yeah, Yeah, maybe. But I mean, I don't think it's been an issue of like being inundated with campaign signs that no one's taking down. I mean, what you see more <laughs> often, and maybe nobody cares, are, you know, little signs, you know, painting by Joe and, and right. these, these things. And maybe they're fine, but maybe we should say, okay, for a month, you can say, you can brag about your good yeah. work, but but not forever. Um, no, that's another example. Yeah. And, and we do, but we do it ad hoc. You know, Mike, when he does see things like that that have been there too long, but it's a judgment call. We don't define what too long is. Yeah, right. right. And we also don't define that, that that type of sign can't be placed on town property. And we don't mm -hmm. define that the sign, if it's on private property, that the, the homeowner or landowner has to give permission. A lot mm -hmm. of that, I mean, you've, mm -hmm. seen, you've, seen, you've seen campaign signs Oh, that's right. Down on we're, 495. We're, we're, right. You know yeah. that the owner of the land is someplace in Venezuela on some you know, <laughs> sheep farm, and he never got permission to get permission to get permission. Yeah. 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 So, yeah, so, you know. Yeah, again, I don't want to solve it tonight, but I just right. wanted to raise, right. the, yeah. Yeah. raise the point. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah. then, um, so, at this point, there is no, nothing that's, I'm, 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 that's one reason I came in. I want to make sure that the Tennessee gas signs were not where they weren't supposed to be. 
So it doesn't have to be so many feet off the easement or whatever. There's nothing there. No, the bylaw is silent. It's silent. But right. we're looking. To, we're looking to. No, I understand the future, but at this point in time. Stick them anywhere you want. I've told them to keep it off. <laughs> Yeah, the only right. <laughs> that, that, that being said, if they, are, if they become a hazard or yeah, no, driver's, then the, then but they I, would I, would, I thought there was something. You know, my, so many feet. My, 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 my first instinct was to say, well, there shouldn't be in the town easement, but yeah. the landowner is not going to know where the town easement is. Right. The easement exactly. varies from, right. from, from, from property yeah. to property, right. so yeah. that would be an unfair thing to, to, to tell the landowner. Okay, mm -hmm. that solves that problem. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, next is a proposal to form a human services committee, which is attached, and uh, Pat Ben Settler is the uh, champion for that and um, has come to meet with me previously to discuss this. So, I'm, to do justice to it, I think Pat should get to talk about it or at least answer any questions that the select may have. I think it's a great idea. Oh, thank That's you. Great. I think it's a great idea. you know the issue really came down for me is that as a as an individual I can't really apply for grants there's not a concept of agency and contact mm -hmm. you know I've been to group meetings on suicide for example and they want to come into Bolton but they want us to be semi-official you know and so I think all in all it would yeah. Enable the process. I think it's a great idea. Well, thank you very much. Are you are you, are you confident you're going to have enough interest? Because I mean, we have these we're, we're missing members on various on various committees. But do you think you're going to have any problem pulling together a, a group of five people on the uh, to get this rolling? Well, I hope we won't. I think that. Um, one of the things Don and I talked about was, you know, obviously we want it to be open, but at the same time we'd like to have communities represented, like the school. So going to the school and having them maybe appoint somebody from their community, mm -hmm. you know, looking at making sure that all of our communities, the, the children, the little ones, um, are represented as well. So I think that um, you know, we have great people in town that are really experts. And a um, combination of letting people raise their hands mm -hmm. and then maybe asking folks. Mm -hmm. to, uh, to Pat's point, because we work very closely from the police department with Pat and the different groups, as you know, in the past we've had various topic seminars, teen dating violence, domestic violence, uh, child violence, violence to elders and seniors. And every time we've had a seminar, usually on Saturdays, we've had a full house. They've, they've been very well attended. We always, our state senator and state rep have always mm -hmm. attended those. Um, we've always packed the place. So I don't think that there would be a, a, a shortage of people in town that would want to get involved mm -hmm. in these types of issues. So, mm -hmm. and as I said, working very closely with Pat, I, I really do think that's a great idea okay. to sort of formalize it. Mm -hmm. And we're working now, we have actively, um, uh, in September, a um, joint venture, if you will, between the town and the Council on Aging. Um, we're going to be holding a three-session um, series of meetings for those folks who are caregivers for folks with dementia or Alzheimer's. Uh -huh. And um, with the idea that we'll be moving to a support group. Well, it's, you know, it's not surprising, but really the response has been across the board because you have young families who, you know, they find out that mom or dad all of a sudden has early onset. Um, their concern is raised. Um, so again, it's kind of across the board. We're meeting a lot of different needs, mm -hmm. and so far, so far, my understanding is that we're getting good response. Mm -hmm. Great. One of my staff meetings a few months ago, um, I held in the public safety building specifically, so Pat could could bring in um, some experts on uh, Alzheimer's and mm -hmm. the, the spot the early warning signs. 
Um, that, that was really the sole topic of the staff meeting was to provide that for them. The next three meetings that she has coming up uh, are from, I think, 10.30 a.m. to noon, if I remember correctly. Uh, 10 to 11.30. 10 to 11.30. I knew it was an hour and a half, so. <laughs> um, I can't just shut down the town for an hour and a half, three times, uh, to have everybody go attend that, but I'm working on something where I want to work with the department heads to see if we can, uh, you know, make it a voluntary thing if people are willing to make up their time, you know, other, you know, later in the day to come attend that, then they're welcome to come attend that. Um, That's great. So I'm, I'm still wordsmithing that one because of uh, past practices and the like. So, but I'm, I'm trying to come up with something that that will work. I mean, I'll certainly yeah. be there, and I'm, and I'm sure some of my staff will be there. How? broad a response that we can get from the town employees i'm, I'm not sure about that yeah is that going to be recorded for cable it, the last one was i'm sorry uh, it was recorded for cable the last time I no and the uh, the reason behind it is that this is really private conversations you have okay. a caregiver coming in and, and wants to understand what's going on with their loved one that's not the sort of thing we want okay. to be able yeah. to broadcast but it is on the web and we have scheduled um, another forum in December on the 10 signs. So, you know, we're kind of covering all of the bases as best we can and with the idea that this would have a support group, an ongoing support group that would enable other people to come into the process down the road. I did come to one of the Saturday morning uh, seminars, I believe we, that one was on domestic violence, teen violence, and the and the like. And uh, someone, from, one of the assistant district attorneys from uh, DA Joe Early's office was there, and she did a fantastic job mm -hmm. and had a very good turnout that morning for that. Mm -hmm. Well, we've had superb support. Again, every one of the forums on domestic violence, there was um, an assistant DA, at least one, mm -hmm. and uh, one we had four or five. Good. And so um, there would need to be a vote of the board to try to establish that human services okay. committee. I will move that we uh, approve the formation of the human services exploratory committee as outlined. I'll second that. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Aye. Great. 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 Thank you. Good luck. Thank you for stepping up. Moving on to demonstrate it has been a busy summer. Um, <laughs> update on the 911 grant application. Um, as I informed the board via email, we did receive our 911 grant award. It was $47,600 in round numbers. Um, I, I drafted a, a contract for the scope of services with the uh, uh, consultant. He reviewed it, he signed it, um, just I think yesterday uh, the town accountant signed it attesting to the availability of funds. Um, probably, uh, I'm not in the office tomorrow, so I'd say Tuesday morning I will sign the contract. Linda will scan it, we'll uh, get a, a PDF out to him and we already have our kickoff meeting scheduled uh, for Wednesday morning, September 10th at 8 a.m. at a venue to be determined. Not sure exactly where in town we're meeting yet, but we will have that that meeting uh, where um, I believe um, hopefully all of all of our public safety department heads will be able to attend, and um, the chief, the police, the chief of police, and the fire chief from Berlin. We also went on a to, to to get things rolling. We went on a site visit today. Chief Alfano, Lieutenant Nelson, um, and the police chief and fire chief from Berlin went to Devon's and, and met with the director. We, we met with the director for about an hour and then did a tour after that, covered a lot of ground just to answer some basic questions and be able to observe the facility in action. So that helps uh, create a context for um, our discussions and I'm, I'm, I'm working on a, on a date hopefully next week that I can uh, get our fire chief and ambulance director up there. Okay. They're right available today. Okay. Mm -hmm. And finally, a recommendation on reverse 911 as I sent in an email to you previously. Uh, Chief Alfano organized this uh, 
a meeting with the Code Red uh, salesperson. Uh, and Code Red is on the state bid list, so we don't need to do any uh, procurement on this. Uh, uh, th this application is currently in 170 municipalities in the state, as well as other states. Um, we've been, uh, Chief and I have been very concerned for a while now about um, the uh, unavailability of any reverse 911 service now that the Sheriff's Department has had issues. Um, we relied on them uh, through their good, you know, through their graciousness in the past, and um, they, they, the system is not operable at this point, I believe. So um, we we need something. Uh, I have to admit that the expense was a lot lower than what I, I expected to see. Um, uh, $3,900 a year for the uh, type of service that we believe we would need um, seems to me like it, it, it's a reasonable amount. It is an unbudgeted item for FY15, but fortunately I still have Purchase of services, although I don't have engineering <laughs> services anymore. Despite the best efforts of the Look at five thousand dollars of purchase of services. So I, I think it's an absolutely reasonable use of purchase of services money um, to put thirty nine hundred dollars on the tours to purchase of this. Uh, the, the, the salesperson said since they have had this product on the market, no uh, no client has ever had their fee raised. So they, you know, uh, they gave us as close to a guarantee as we can get that, mm -hmm. that, that, that we're not going to see the $3,900 go up. And we can plan for it in the FY16 budget. The more I've thought about it, I do think the appropriate sp uh, place in the FY16 budget would be the emergency management budget. Mm -hmm. uh, because 99 times out of 100, that's what we're going to be using. Mm -hmm. right? yeah. So um, any questions you may have on this? No, I think it's great. I think, I, it's great. I, I, I think it's great. I mean, I guess one question would be, you know, the school already has something similar to this. Don't they, they? they have reverse 911 capability. Right. They do. I didn't know if, the, if that was something we could leverage, you know, leverage their system. It, it just, just instead of having two parallel systems covering the same basic territory. Uh, do you want to respond to that? Yes, Jeff? yeah, I can. I can yeah. answer that. The school si the system is not geared towards more emergencies, okay. and, and it's not really a twenty four seven system. For okay. example, if there's no school, or there's no, it's during the summertime. It's it, they they don't use it. Okay. It's more geared towards school related issues. Right. Um, and one, one capability that it doesn't have is there's an automatic alert, say for a tornado. Mm -hmm. A tornado is 15 minutes away. Yeah. It then automatically gets triggered through no action on our part at all. That, that's not a capability that the school system would okay. have. Okay. Plus, okay. with the code, the code red system, we would control that through our, our dispatch center. Mm -hmm. We could generate those messages, right. and again, we're open 24-7. So yeah. it, uh, and it wouldn't just encompass school emergencies. So I, I see what you're saying, but it's really two separate systems. J just trying to make sure that we're not double paying for mm -hmm. it. Yeah. Thank you. Great question. Yeah. Okay. Can you, what about like people's um, cells? Can they opt in to the system so it's it's not just hidden landlines? No, it absolutely it includes cells. Yeah, you actually sign up for it. Okay. In other words, they have a database that they will provide. They can actually collect all the numbers in town, and, but there's there's also a sign up. And they can opt out as well Yeah. if they don't want that. Okay. okay. If you really don't want to know the attorney that's coming. That's right. Stop tracking me. You don't need to vote on this. Uh, I actually do need a vote. Yeah. Okay, I, 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 <laughs> I move that we authorize the uh, the purchase of the uh, Code Red uh, Reverse 911 system. I'll or second that. Purchase the services of. I will second that. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chief, for organizing that. And I had a great day. Thank you. And unless there are any other questions from the board, that concludes my. <laughs> 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 All it's right. Some person busy. All right. It's up to you, Larry. Okay. Make up that time. <laughs> yeah. We uh, yeah. we have twenty minutes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> our oh wow, boy, really. Our our board of selectmen business. The first thing we have are appointments from the cable advisory committee. Um, I think this was something that that Ken had suggested, and that we thought, well, it's a, a three member committee and. We decided let's advertise to see <coughs> if there are additional folks uh, interested and do, do we? We have two. 
Ken Troop and Bob Johnson. Okay. Okay. And didn't Ken have another? He did, but I did not hear from that person, so Ken was going to reach out to him. Okay. So okay, at one point Ken thought that, is it Bill Stratko? Yes. Yep. Okay. All right, but he, we're not sure about him. We're not. Nope. Okay. So this will, we'll, we'll uh, complete the, the, the two, and if we get a third name, then we can add it on later. Okay. Uh, I move that we appoint um, Ken Troop and Robert Johnson to the Cable Advisory Committee. I'll second that. All those in favor? Aye. 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 The next thing we have to do is to appoint a Chief Procurement Officer. I don't know that we have too many candidate, potential <laughs> candidates for this. <laughs> I, uh, I, 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 I serve as the Chief Procurement <laughs> Officer. I have all my certifications. The state contacted us and said, you know, we would like to get an updated um, uh, because the, we we did file paperwork back four and a half years ago, whatever it was, uh, five years ago when I was uh, when I was originally appointed. Once I completed my training, but they would like an updated uh, appointment. Then we appoint uh, Donlo, our town minister, as our chief procurement officer. I'll second that. All those in favor? Aye. Senior Housing Corporation and the Town of Bolton to lease the office space at the uh, uh, Senior Center. I think this is similar to the lease from last year, except I noticed they didn't have the attachment was blank. The attachment that shows the office space was blank. Mm -hmm. So we can probably pull that off of last year's lease. I'm sure we can. Uh, and then this, this I remember last year the city had the discussion saying that there can be no political activity no because of the HUD requirements at the uh, senior center. So even even an innocuous selectman's debate for, uh, is prohibited. It's true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, I reviewed the lease. Um, I discussed it with Sheila, and, um, and she and she was comfortable with it as well. I have a question yeah. about that because I'm with Friends of Bolton Seniors and we do a monthly program at the Senior <coughs> Center. And um, during town election times, we will invite people who are running for office to come and sort of field questions. Would that fall under? Well, amazingly, it does. I know we have done that in the past, but I, yeah. I think that the. Um, yeah, no, these HUD requirements are very specific, and it even includes okay. the sort of, you know, yeah. uh, local um, uh, things, so they have to have to find another venue for that, which is, uh, seems too bad, but, but that's their, you know, they have it in their lease, but they're right, that okay. that's uh, right. prohibited. Well, is the, is the senior housing that's going to go up? Next to yours, is that going to be HUD control or is that? Uh, oh, that's an assisted living facility. Right. Well, maybe you could. Uh, Fair game. Well, we'll we'll have to move over there. Go over there. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Okay. All right. So well, we need a motion to uh, execute the lease. I will move the federal move to execute the lease. I'll second. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Everyone's signing on that. There's two 
right, our next item is a request for members of town government to participate in the reenactment of the Worcester Revolution of 1774. And we, we got some materials. This is actually very interesting. We got some materials from a group in Worcester that is having on uh, September 7th uh, an event or a day long series of events that are celebrating the little little known as they say uh, as a result of a historic oversight the fact that in September of 1774 4,600 militiamen uh, arrived in Worcester from 37 towns in Worcester County and shut down the British courthouse and that this was uh, uh, the following spring when General Gage was thinking about uh, retaliating he decided that uh, Worcester was was um, not a good location and headed for Concord instead. So I, I think it's a <laughs> <laughs> this is yeah. I I've never heard of this. I think it's very interesting. I I may well head down there on September seventh. I, I don't know if anyone else is interested, but I uh, I had never heard of this, but it's uh, that's fascinating. So. I'm Barry. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm staying till the end for this because uh, I wanted to know what they wanted you to do um, with the historical society we've worked with Freedom's Way and we um, also worked with the American Antiquarian Society which is one of the groups that is sponsoring this event and um, Bolton sent a hundred militiamen That's to, amazing. to this so we did participate um, and I think it's, if anyone's interested, they have a website, um, um, Worcester 1774, so you can see the list of events. But what, what do they want you to do? Well, you know, it's a little unclear. They, say, they write, would two members of your town's government represent Bolton in the reenactment of the Worcester Revolution okay. of 1774? So I don't, I don't know if we have to hold a musket or what. Well, there's, um, there's a reenactment yeah, yeah, I think a whole bunch of uh, stuff. Uh, yeah, no, there are lots of events, but it was unclear where. I, I, where think, you guys I think it's the 4 p.m. I see. Walking, walking the gauntlet? The I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so is the historic society going to do anything? No, on this? and you know we couldn't find anything about this, but there was a Ebenezer Hartman from Westminster, uh, Westboro who kept a diary, and his son gave him a list of all of these 4,600. Uh, militia um, groups and Bolton is listed handwritten mm -hmm. with a hundred uh, wow. members represented. So that's that is pretty, that's cool. remarkable. That's pretty cool. That's remarkable. What was your interest in Freedom's Way and um, the American Antiquarian Society? Freedom's Way is, is I don't even know if they're part of this. All right, the next item we have on our agenda is to discuss FY15 goals for Neshoba Regional School District. Stan, you might have... Uh, yes, I, I asked to put that on. As a matter of fact, uh, next Wednesday we have the first Tritown uh, meeting of the season. Tritown meeting is where the three towns get together and hopefully you know, members of the school district and uh, the school committee and discuss issues. And uh, I know one of the agenda items uh, for next Wednesday is sort of a discussion of where the district and the school committee are relative to the, the latest five-year plan. If you go on the website, they have a, we can download the last five-year plan and you can download the current five-year plan. But I know we've had some discussion with the district and the school committee members in past um, Tritown meetings where uh, there are a number of organizations, both local and nationally, that rank school districts and, and the national is do more at the high school level of where uh, the rankings of high schools or school districts are either nationally or within a, with a particular state. And it's been fairly consistent. So, I mean, this is not anything, my opinion or the opinion of the board select but there seems to be a, a consistent ranking of, of schools where if you look at the Boston Business Journal, uh, which does Massachusetts, 
Uh, if you look, look at U.S. News and World Report, which does nationally, so they rank nationally as well as by state, and Newsweek does a similar thing. And then there are other things. I found something out today where there's another group that sort of ranks uh, you know, in the, within the state. And what the one thing that is fairly consistent with with all of the organizations that are ranking the schools is that the the Shoba Regional School District, or let, let's let's say the high school in particular, is typically ranked at the bottom of the top 25 percent. So, from one perspective, that, that well, we're in, we're in the top 25 percent, but we're at the bottom, but we're at the top 25 percent. But consistently, you'll see schools like Acton Boxborough High School in Acton Boxborough and the high school in Harvard that are ranked much higher than Bolton consistently. Uh, and then earlier this year, I came across on our own Massachusetts Department of Education website where they have profiles of individual schools, districts, and high schools uh, in the state. And even they rank the three schools that I mentioned approximately in the same place as does Boston Business Journal, Newsweek, and U.S. News and World Report, where um, I figure which, which one is which, but one is number two and one is number 15, uh, and we're, we're down there. Now, in, in the Department of Education website, they have these report cards or snapshots where they have sort of a summary which talks about where they are level-wise and there's a category of levels. They rank them as far as proficiency against the other schools in the state and then they, they, they talk about you know SAT scores and MCAT scores and where the state averages are and where they are ranked. If you look at, and again I'll pick on Harvard and at the Boxborough, they, the state rates them at a 90, 97% proficiency against other schools in the state. The Neshoba Regional School District, and more importantly, the high school, is rated at 76%. And that is consistent with what, what, what we've seen as far as the national rankings. So I guess a question that we've had is, you know, why is that? And what, obviously these different groups do different rankings, but even our state is sort of doing the same thing as far as how they assess. You know, what makes Harvard and Acton Boxborough, from a ranking perspective, so much higher than Neshoba Regional uh, High School? And it's a question that we really haven't gotten an answer to yet. And I think part of our issue of of town valuation, and I don't know we don't get into tax rate and whatnot, but town valuation and why we have not come back as much as some other towns from, from the financial issues back in 2007 and 8, I think is in part due to the fact that when families are looking, especially out of state families, are looking to move to Massachusetts or you know other parts of Massachusetts to come to perhaps Bolton. They'll look at these community rankings and they'll see, you know, one's number two, one's number 15, we're number 76, they have proficiencies of 97% and we have proficiencies of 76. And I don't know what all the numbers mean and I'm hoping that we can have a dialogue with the superintendent uh, and, and the school committee to better understand that and as part of the five-year plan that they now have, which talks about improvement, how can we get from the ranking that we have now to say to the next 5%? And then maybe the year after we can get to the next 5%. Because I can't see why we can't be ranked similarly with these other schools where we're spending sort of the same amount of money. So I, you know, I can't, can't see that the argument that throw more money at it is gonna solve the problem. Where you know, many of the school districts that are ranked higher than us both the Department of Education and these third party organizations. In some cases, some of these districts are spending less money than, than we are per pupil. So, but it's more, you know, to engage the district and the school committee to see, you know, and better understand 
why we rank the way we do and how we can possibly improve those numbers, which I think will have a, a, a direct correlation on valuation of the town, which will have a direct impact on what your home is worth when you go to sell it. That, that's the real key to, to that. So that's nothing that we're going to solve now, but I think we can kick that off with uh, our discussion with the, with the Tri-Town next week. Yeah, well, no, that, I mean, that, that's certainly that's certainly worth discussing, and, and you're right. We, we um, the high school is not not rated as as, as highly on on these things as as many of us would would like, and it's and it's unclear why. And so, you, right, yeah. No, and I, I know I, I'm a big believer in root cause analysis, and I think you know instead of maybe spending too much time at the 50,000 foot level of, you know, should we be 25th versus 23rd versus 21st? Um, it's really important to engage in, you know, what are the factors that go into those rankings, you know, some of the data points, and then uh, how do we compare there, you know, um, is it that we have a sufficient amount of AP classes, but maybe some of the uh, some of the kids that don't perform as well, maybe they don't feel we're serving them as well. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Maybe we are. Maybe maybe we maybe we are. Um, one thing that I, I I think would be interesting would be. I mean, we we talk a lot about school choice as far as influx comes, but we must also have a certain amount of school choice kids that go out elsewhere. So it'd be interesting to see where those students are going, why they're going there, mm -hmm. and what programs are being offered elsewhere that we're, that we're not offering that maybe, right. maybe, right. Uh, oh, yeah. Or losing kids to private school. Or losing maybe kids to private school. Some of your, the smartest kids in town are going off to Worcester Academy or something right. that because they're not choosing to go to the high school. Exactly right. Yeah. So, so to understand the outflow, I think, and you know, it's, it, we're not unique. I think a lot of school, a lot of school districts focus on school choice as far as how many kids are getting in, but I think you need to understand why you lose kids as right, well. Right, right. So. Yeah. That Tri-Town is in Lancaster. It is. Yes, yes. It was confirmed. And that's next, next Wednesday. 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 So, so you want me to try and get something added to the agenda then? I think something to talk okay. more about you know, this, this more uh, shorter term kind of Look, review. I think the, the five year plan is a is a really broad plan that covers a lot of things and I think you know I think part of that needs to include, you know, looking at why we're ranked the way we are, you know, the inflows and the outflows that you had mentioned and, and you know part of that five year plan is how do we improve that, that So can you give me an idea of how you'd like that worded? I'll I'll get some to you. Okay. I'll try. I, yeah. you know, contacted them this afternoon yeah, I, to I let them that, yeah. know that, that we were going to have something else, and I haven't heard from anybody. Yeah. So. We, we didn't get the notice until probably three o'clock yesterday. Yeah. I know it was very yeah. short. So, okay. I had something well, I wanted to be there. there. I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah. No. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I, I already have a request in. That no. I didn't get to Linda until just before four. So. Yeah. Um, okay. All right, our next item is review minutes. I know actually, I do we have minutes? We do. Okay. March 20th and May 20th. Wow, actually. golden oldies. Yeah. <laughs> Moving along. <laughs> when would we uh, approve the uh, minutes as presented? I'll second them. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. And while we're signing, uh, I reminded myself to do a little public service announcement, which I do every once in a while. Two things, I think, two. One is it's still summer. Uh, if you're bringing uh, items to the transfer station, uh, glass bottles and and uh, you know beer bottles and wine bottles, if you could you could rinse those out a little bit. Uh, they do attract a lot of bees, uh, and it makes it kind of difficult if they're there. The other thing is, is that people are doing a fabulous job of bringing their um, glass and aluminum, but some of that uh, are items that have deposits on them, like soda bottles and beer bottles, and etc. And the containers are are chock full of that stuff. But the there is a little red building 
as you come into the transfer station, and that's where the Boy Scouts have a building where you can deposit uh, those items that have a return on them uh, because the, the bottle and can collection is the primary fundraising vehicle for the Boy Scouts in Bolton. So you're doing a great job bringing them to transfer station. You're just bringing them a little too far. We just got to back up and bring them to the Little Red Building. We would greatly appreciate that. Thanks. All right. Well, that's the end of our um, regular meeting. And we're now going to go into executive session pursuant to NGL Chapter 30A, Section 21A3 to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining for the police and dispatch units on the basis that an open meeting would have a detrimental effect on the bargaining position of the town. And since we're going into executive session, we'll do it in by roll call. We will not be re-emerging. And we are <laughs> not re-emerging. Ever. Ever. <laughs> Ever. Better than we can. Yes. Delaney. Yes. Misaki. Yes. Uh, Thank you very much. Thank you. Good night. Nancy, what are you hanging out for? I, well, I really want to get that sign so I want to make sure you're not doing something wrong. Well, <laughs> 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 oh, I kept hearing it had to be 20, a heavy off the easement. You can shut us.